The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Brother has taken control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul, watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia, live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. Like nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. It's Monday, January 15th, Tuesday, January 16th, and if you're on the East Coast or across the pond, how are you? This is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, live from the Great White North in the Caribou region on top of the snowy mountains of central British Columbia, right here, stationed at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong nightly on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, And on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We are also live on SpacedOutRadio.com, Spreaker, The Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas, the High Plains Talk Radio Network. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to FreedomSlips.com and donate today. You can also check us out live on Periscope. Hi, Periscope. How are you? Good to see you. We are live right there. Just go to Spaced Out Radio. That's where we are. Go into that little search box and go to Spaced Out Radio. We're on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like. Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. So you go to YouTube.com forward slash spaced out radio we're right there don't forget periscope we need those hearts we need those hearts listen to us on iheart radio in the united states tune us in on tune in download and subscribe to our shows from itunes and of course our website 
is spacedoutradio.com. Now, we also have a GoFundMe account going on right now. It's gofundme.com forward slash we own the night. That's gofundme.com forward slash we own the night. We definitely want to build a brand new studio here in SOR headquarters. We need it to go terrestrial. We have stations lining up to get us. We got to build it on up. Share the post from GoFundMe. Or donate if you have it already, if you have the ability to do so. But sharing is just as important. So it's GoFundMe.com forward slash We Own The Night. If you head to our website, SpacedOutRadio.com, you can go to the Spaced Out Radio store, pick up a t-shirt, read the encounter online, dealing with everything paranormal, strange, and odd. You can read my latest blog there as well. And, of course, we got great videos from Tim Doyle's UFO Seekers and Leslie Mitchell Clark's Contact TV. It's been a busy month in the world of UFOs and disclosure with the mainstream media. Names like Anderson Cooper and Tucker Carlson really asking questions about the UFO phenomenon? But is the mainstream media asking the right questions? So much has gone on since the New York Times article declaring the United States government did indeed spend money to research UFOs. But did that project end back in 2012 like the article says it did? Tonight, making his monthly appearance on SOR, is Tim Doyle from UFO Seekers. Yes, fans, his goatee looks fantastic heading into tonight. And Tim has been a prime player in researching information about everything from the To The Stars campaign to UFOs in general. It's been a busy few weeks since the news went public, and tonight we get an update from the man, the myth, and the UFO legend, Tim Doyle himself. Tim, how you doing, my friend? Pretty good, Dave. It's It's great great to be on with you again. Always good to have you. Always good to get a goatee update because you know my fans are very, very intrigued in that. And, you know, it's just one of those things that we do. Yeah, well, I think it, uh, you know, has a lot to do with the weather here in California. helps it grow correctly, you know, because I do live by, like, the giant sequoia redwood trees. So I think it's that weather that kind of stimulates the facial hair growth. So. I'm packing the full beard these days, and it's starting to get thick. It's starting to get a little a little husky on it. I'm not sure I like it or not, but we're going to continue it right for, for, well, for right now. You know, that's just the way it's going to go. But, hey, sometimes in the Canadian winters, you got to stay warm somehow, and that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing right now, my friend. And uh, <laughs> a few, few of the fans have been watching us on Periscope say, don't you dare shave that off. Don't you dare. But... Who knows? We're going to see where it goes. Tim, uh, I want to start off this show because this is the first one of 2018 for you. But I want to start off this show uh, by saying you did an absolutely amazing, amazing job on a video you recently published at ufoseekers.com. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes to to, uh, talk about this video because... In California in the nineteen mid nineteen eighties, before we even knew there was a stealth fighter, and the F one seventeen really wasn't public until nineteen eighty nine. But you were able to actually find a crash site that has, was very difficult to find. I would love it if you describe what this crash site is all about. Yeah, so. Um, it was in 1986, and it was in uh, July of 1986. There was a squadron of F-117 uh, research and test pilots at Tonopah Test Range. And Tonopah Test Range is inside the same facility where you'd find Area 51. And so this uh, on, on this night, there was a pilot. His name was Major Mulher, and he was part of the 4,440th uh, test group. And so they were called the night stalkers. And what they do is they would do uh, night test flights and dog fights, uh, simulated dog fights, stuff like that, um, with the most sensitive aircraft. And specifically at that time, it was the F-17. And like you said, uh, the public didn't know about that aircraft even existing. So um, he was out on a mission And supposedly from eyewitnesses, there was more than one craft. So it's believed that he was uh, doing some type of dogfighting. But they flew out of Tonopah and they headed towards Bakersfield, California, 
uh, which would be just north of Los Angeles. And they started making like a westerly, northwesterly turn um, towards the north and then uh, basically was pointed back towards Area 51, but just on the edge of Bakersfield, so at about 20,000 feet uh, altitude. And supposedly during this turn, the pilot lost consciousness and flew at about Mach 1 into the side of a mountain uh, located about a mile and a half north of the Kern River, uh, just east here of Bakersfield. So it's actually about 25 minutes away from my location where UFO Seekers headquarters is. And so on the day when it crashed, um, it took about an hour and a half for the Air Force to respond. And they did a full recovery on the crash site location. And of course, because of the speed of the craft, uh, disintegrated upon impact and spread out throughout uh, a rugged mountain range, but it, it hit like in a depression in a canyon. So once it hit, it kind of bounced up and fully broke apart and just spread across the canyon and up multiple hillsides. And then it started a brush fire. And so it happened at about two in the morning and immediately firefighters responded, uh, of course, to stop the brush fire, which grew to about 600 acres before they got it out. But of course, there was uh, Air Force people on scene with like uh, M16s, you know, fully armed, and they closed the site down, and they actually closed the airspace down above too, so civilian aircrafts couldn't go overhead. No one could visit the site, and in fact, um, I've talked to people who lived in a ranch near there. And so the Air Force was actually going through people's ranches to get to the crash site location. And it became like a national security site, and it was closed down for a full month before they opened it back up to the public. And immediately the media started responding with, they said, sources from Washington, D.C. were saying it was an F-19 which supposedly was a craft that had folding wings, but it was a stealth aircraft. And of course, no one really knew what stealth meant at that time. So in the video, I post some newspaper articles that I managed to pull up of the incident from that day. Of course, there was like a media blackout. So the main newspapers in our area, it was impossible for me to find uh, like the main news source newspapers from that specific date. So some of the newspaper articles, clippings I found were from other states. I mean, from like, you know, I'd say like Maryland or Maine or something. It was really odd. And so supposedly this Stealth 19 had folding wings and it could go in the back of a C-5, like a cargo transport airplane. And it would be delivered before an airstrike. So if the, milita- if the Air Force was going to launch an airstrike on an enemy, what they'd do is they'd send in this stealth craft Uh, which was very small and could evade radar, which is all the media really knew, and it could destroy radar systems and anti-aircraft systems before an airstrike was actually executed. And so that's kind of what everyone was speculating crashed at the site. And it's very interesting because to this day, still no one has ever seen an F-19 because the mil- the military decided to stop using their sequential uh, numerical system. You know, so each each next jet is like the F-21 and then the F-22 and the F-23. Well, for some reason, they skipped all the way to the 22. And so no one's ever seen like that F-19 um, and other secret projects that may have been going on. So it wasn't until later, um, until, like you said, like 89, 89, late 88 when it finally became public that this aircraft existed and that's when documents started becoming declassified in the late 90s and people eventually learned that it was an f-117 that had crashed at that site and And so so basically like the crash site the crash site was a secret so when i started looking uh when tracy and i started looking for the location you you couldn't find the actual crash site coordinates. They weren't available anywhere. So 31 years after the crash happened, still 
before our video, no one knew publicly where the crash site location was. So right off the bat, that, that made it very difficult. And all we had was uh, supposedly after the incident, the Air Force left behind a flagpole with a flag flying on a hilltop above the little uh, canyon where the aircraft had crashed and the pilot died. And so basically we knew there was a flagpole somewhere in the mountains. And from the newspaper articles we pulled up, uh, the military lied and said it happened on Saturday Peak. Um, it eventually was down in a canyon below Saturday Peak. And uh, we used like a drone and other means to basically find the area. And in fact, I had to eventually hike up into the mountains on a hunch where we thought it would be. And I ended up finding the flagpole. Um, and I did have a metal detector with me and ended up finding pieces of the wreckage, including some fabric, which we think may be part of the gentleman's flight suit. And so I've collected those parts and uh, they're on their way back to Edwards Air Force Base to the museum. And Edwards Air Force Base was the actual uh, facilitator of the of the crash site location. So at least it's going back to the same people that were in charge of the crash site. Tim, one of the things that I was very intrigued about is why you did that story, because you were so much about UFOs, you were so much about, you know, trying to seek what is flying in the sky. Why did you feel it was important to bring this F-117 story to light 30 years later? Um, well, I kind of feel like that's disclosure, you know, so here we have um, people can find articles about speculation of what crashed at this site. And so, I mean, you can even find quality, um, like quality journalists like the aviationist or maybe even the drive, which is done by time incorporated, you know, and they still speculate about what type of crash crashed at the site. And so, yes, it's, I mean, if you want to just go by what government documents say and what the government story is, oh, you know, of course, it's a 117 that crashed there. And so these parts or this wreckage that we found are parts of that. But, hey, if we're on, on the speculation track and we really don't know what it is, I mean, honestly, we could have parts of a military UFO or um, that F-19 that no one's ever seen. And I think that's kind of what, uh, UFO research should be about, you know, so we managed to legitimately find a location that no one had made public and we made it public for the first time. And then we also managed to recover wreckage after 31 years. And probably the best part is that we found some fabric uh, from that flight suit and hopefully it gets back to the family. So, you know, and that was a big thing for us too, was being able to show that location to the family of the pilot. Cause I'm sure they have uh you know, their own family meetings or events where they get together and talk about Major Mulher. And it's it's a good feeling to know that these people who lived in the area during that time um, or even people who are impacted by it can watch the video and kind of recount, you know, that day and the events that occurred. You mentioned that it, this is kind of a form of disclosure. What makes you believe that it was an F-117 and not some other type of craft? Uh, nothing. I would say nothing more than the story of what the military says happened there. You know, so I would personally not say definitively, hey, this is what crashed there. You know, but if we go and we look at the flag post, and as we can see, like in the videos and the photographs, we got that there was a F-117 um, emblem on the flag post. And of course, the video is available on our YouTube channel, um, UFO Seekers. Um, stealth crash site revealed. And, you know, so it's kind of like that emblem on the flag post of the F-117 and then the documents and the story. Um, so that's, you know, kind of just the accepted theory, you know. So I guess if we were talking about Egyptian hieroglyphs and, hey, here's the theory about what this means, you know, I, I kind of take it like that. You know, this is the main theory that, the, you know, the main experts would say is accepted, you know, so I wouldn't say that it's definitive. Hey, this is exactly what crashed there. And, 
the way the military operates, I don't ever trust like what they say. I mean, I don't trust anything they say because it's like their job to protect um, and to deceive, you know, to keep people safe. So. You said you found some artifacts from that crash site 31 years later. What were you able to find? Um, well, basically, we found a little a little piece that looks like some type of uh, carbon fiber or like a wire mesh, um, probably like an inch by an inch, and it's extremely stiff, you know. So, um, and it's painted black, so it really makes us wonder if this was part of the radar absorbing material, because uh, from what we heard it's something that was like glued to the outer skin of the craft. And of course it's covered in like a radar absorbing paint. So you have like the radar absorbing material and then a radar absorbing paint. And so we did find uh, multiple pieces of metal, uh, probably up to three to four inches long um, that were painted black. And so we did find some other pieces that were painted white. Um, Some pieces, obviously aluminum, uh, one piece looked kind of like pot metal that had black paint on it. And then, I mean, the greatest, um, and so you also had the white fabric pieces that were probably about an inch, inch to two inch long, which was amazing to find. Cause I just found it with my eye, you know, the metal detector doesn't detect the fabric. So I thought that was incredible. Uh, but the main piece that was amazing is this, it's like a thin piece of like aluminum, but it, or like titanium or something, but it is extremely thin, like not aluminum foil thin, maybe just a little bit thicker than aluminum foil, but it was obviously part of the impact because this piece of metal is like square. It's painted black, but one of the corners is like rolled over towards the center, right? So it has like a little like round fold over, but it's, impacted you know so it's rough it's not of course it's not perfectly flat and smooth anymore it's rough you can tell it's been hit and like burned on certain parts of it but this thing in the state that it's in of the rollover i can't undo it like it the metal is so strong i have no clue like what they made it out of i have no clue like how it's so light so thin and then you could it's so strong like if you had this thing in a sheet, I mean, so that was pretty incredible. And that's, you know, that does make me think about, well, I don't, I don't know if this is like the F-117, you know, so. What did you end up doing with those artifacts, Tim? Uh, they are headed back to Edwards Air Force Base. So, and of course, if it's the radar absorbing material, Um, I was warned that graphite can come off of it, you know, so these artifacts you aren't supposed to like handle without gloves or the graphite will go like right through your skin into your blood system. Um, And, you know, the, the recipe for radar absorbing material is still uh, like a secret. So to have like the parts is kind of to put yourself in an, a position of getting into trouble. So it's not something where we'd even want to keep these things. Um, of course, like someone was killed there and it was a real person. So there's always that to keep in mind. Um, of course, like when I was up there, I said a prayer for Mr. Mulher, you know, and thanked him for his service, you know, and just wanted to let him know that people like me were still thinking about the sacrifice he made for our country. Um, you know, it's pretty crazy. So, you know, that's why we don't want to hold on to these parts. Um, it's not something where I'd want like a <laughs> like a Russian to show up on my doorstep one day and, hey, you got the parts, you know, and get, get us ourselves into trouble. So, yeah, they can go back to uh, the base, you know, but I just want people to keep in mind, too, that when you have real parts from a real thing that um, – have like real secrets or value behind them. It's not something that you can just hang on to or store away. So it's something that they want back and something that gets buried in a warehouse or destroyed, you know, so. (laughs) 
Well, either way, I think it's uh, pretty cool that you were able to find that place. How rugged of a search was it for you, Tim? And when you found it, it had to be a pretty emotional moment for you. Yeah, it was extremely difficult to find because, you know, you'd think with a flag post that a drone video camera would be able to see it, you know, from 500 or 1,000 feet away, but uh, we scouted the location for probably five weeks and did multiple drone flights into supposed areas because, of course, we were looking for scarring on the land um, or trace evidence, visual evidence of, like, the brush fire that occurred. Of course, it's, like, 30 years ago, so good luck seeing something like that. And so from all of our flights, and once once I had found the lo- uh, once we had found the location, we realized that we had actually taken flights over the specific hill where the flagpole was, but you couldn't see it. And uh, Tracy and I decided the only way that we were going to find it was for me to hike up. And so um, it was a mile and a half to get to the flagpole with an elevation climb of probably 1,600 feet to 2,000 feet. And we're talking, you're going through an area where it's full of rattlesnakes, so you don't go in the summertime. Plus, I had to cross a river. You know, and that's like a sister canyon to Yosemite National Park um, and Kings Canyon. This is like the sister canyon. It's the next one down. And so this river gets huge uh, when it rains and when the snow melt comes. So it was like perfect timing for me to hop and actually walk across or uh, hop across boulders across the river and then make the trek up in like knee high grass the entire way with holes. I mean, there's gopher holes and rattlesnake holes the whole time. It was crazy. But, uh, of course, they have, like, cows and bulls because a, a lot of that area is cattle lease. That's done through BLM, um, like private cattle leases. So you always have to worry about coming around the corner and running into a bull or a cow or something. So, But uh, lucky for me, the, the crash site was only, uh, like, two ridges from the river. So when I, when I peaked the first ridge, which ironically was like a 1200 foot climb. So if you were down at the river at night and you had seen the crash come overhead and come over the river, the aircraft would have crashed behind the tall mountain, almost straight up like a Canyon cliff that, that hugs the river. And then behind it is just like a level elevation. But and that's where the aircraft crashed, so you couldn't see it from any roadways. Um, so it was once I peaked that first ridge when I saw the flagpole, um, like a thousand yards up into a canyon. So it was pretty awesome. What is the significance of trying to find that site? I remember, I know you mentioned that it had a little bit to do with the whole disclosure type process, but in the end, is it significant? for the family because nobody had visited there publicly is it a is it a personal quest what was the real significance behind this trek for you well, i think it's for the pilot to get recognition you know like i've i've uh, reached out to our local representatives um and asked them if we can work on getting like a plaque or some type of uh, display Uh, down like at the river there's actually like a picnic site slash like campground that's on this river uh you know where you would make the trek to go up into the mountains so it'd be nice to have a a site like that somewhere where civilian people can read hey 30 years ago uh major mohair gave his life in a crash here you know working to help keep the country safe so you know, I think stuff like that is really important, giving people recognition who give their lives f- for serving our country. And, you know, you're not going to get a leak about it. You know, these people are like patriots and, and they keep everything below the cuff, you know, in the cuff. So I, I, I just think like after time goes on, it's nice for those those people to get recognition for their service. So. 
Well, appreciate you doing that, and I really do highly recommend all of our listeners to go to uh, ufoseekers.com to watch the video or head over to Tim's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to it, UFO Seekers, and watch this video. It is very, very, it's an emotional video, and that's why I wanted to talk about it tonight because, you know, it, uh, I honestly had a little bit, uh, I got a little bit choked up when I watched it as well, Tim. And uh, thanks for doing that. I think it, you did a great job with that video. And I want all our listeners to go over to uh, either your YouTube channel, UFO Seekers, or your website, UFOseekers.com, to check that out. Great work. Right on, man. Yeah, I really appreciate that. No problem. And especially to show people that, that we debate like these theories, but there's real real people behind them sometimes. So, Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, let's get to what we bring, brought you on for today, buddy. A little bit of UFOs, a little bit of beer, you know, a little bit of uh, everything that goes on with uh, the whole Disclosure Project. Uh, do we start with the beer before we get into the BS, or do we just hit it hard right off the bat? Yeah, you should just drop a break on the gas pedal. <laughs> All right, well, let's kick her off right now then. But uh, this has been a very busy month and in regards to UFO since you were last on on December 18th. Of course, you were on just shortly after the New uh, York Times article came out about uh, UFOs and it got a little debated. And, and you know, you, you riled up our audience, and I think in a good way, that it, it hit everybody a little bit hard, and I thought it was fantastic and great creative emotional radio that night. And when I look back at it, you and I talked a lot off the air in the days after that regarding a lot of the information that you did not provide on that show. And little did I know that just a couple weeks later, a lot of what you found out happened to come true. Because when we first had you on, a lot of people were upset because we weren't recognizing the fact that disclosure in some form happened. And there was a lot of people out there, especially as experiencers, who were able to get some sort of validity and validation to their stories, to their friends, to their family members, to their peers who made fun of them previously to that. Yet there's so much more to this story. So when you look back on the last few weeks that has happened, what's one of the things that has caught you uh, the most of your attention is what I'm trying to say. Um, well, I think the the disclosures that we've heard about uh, MUFON working with the, the Bigelow Aerospace Company I think that's kind of the biggest revelations from it. And then, of course, it makes a connection to uh, when people talk about the John Carpenter incident from 2000, where he sold 140 alien abduction cases for 14 grand to Robert Bigelow um, as part of the National Institute of Discovery Sciences that Bigelow had opened. And, of course, this was a place where uh, George Knapp was working at that time. So... You know, I think it's nice to have, you know, I really congratulate them for kind of helping us get a better view of what goes on behind the scenes in the in the UFO community and see that there are a lot of like high level people who are kind of interconnected and and work together. Um, and that there are there is like a value to UFO sightings. You know, if if there was some type of program where uh, the military was working to purchase UFO sightings, um, I think it's interesting. And I think it's, uh, I think for me, it was a huge shock, um, like a tremendous shock. So uh, before, I think UFO seekers' main goal was to try to capture evidence and then submit it to MUFON uh, to get credibility. But now, you know, we don't really have a place to submit our sightings anymore. So I don't, it's like if we want to catch evidence and we want people to be scientific about it and to be impartial, I I don't know where that place is right now and where 
to recommend for people to submit UFO sightings. So kind of in response, uh, UFO Seekers now has like a case system, a uh, case ticket system. So if people would like a complete analysis of their UFO sighting or their alien encounter, if they have media or if they have like text, text documents that they'd like to submit, um, our case system is like always there and it'll store your case for is forever. You know, so you can upload the documents there and the media there. You're the only one who has access to it. Um, it's not released to the public like every single sighting um, is from other other organizations. Because um, a lot of times we feel like that allows for like manipulation. So if you're having like real time release of UFO incidents that are happening right now and you could go and see, oh, this second this was seen here, you know, that's. That's what we don't want the military to have. You know, I, I always thought at the beginning of this, and when I looked at the UFO community, when I used to watch X-Files, um, and especially the season one, episode 10, when Mulder meets Max from NICAP, and they're both looking for Fallen Angel, um, and they're locked up in, in a prison cell from the military. You know, and this guy from NICAP is the civilian, you know, working to expose truth against, you know, the military and the government someone on the outside, you know, someone who would never, someone who'd give their life before they'd sell out to the government. Um, you know, because that's the whole point of this. The whole point of the whole UFO question exists because there's government secrecy and national security. You know, there can't be true openness. So I think it, it, it really shocked me to see how we, we, because of the disclosure of that program, uh, which I call it the Aerial Threat Identification Program, I don't call it a UFO program. Um, I call it what the documents state that it's doing. So I don't believe that uh, from like the documents released yet that it was an alien chasing program. I believe that's what Project Blue Book was about, was a, a project to investigate unidentified flying objects with the openness of a question that these might be aliens from another planet. Now, when we're looking at it in, in real time now, I don't, I just, I can't see the Pentagon giving money to someone who says, Hey, we're going to look for aliens because first off, supposedly the government has aliens. So I don't know why they'd pay someone to like, look for aliens. I can perfectly see, and, and I have my own, connections to people who are like in the military who I, I, <laughs> you know, myself, they, I have some of them who tell me aliens exist and I'm like, dude, I'm impartial. I'm never going to believe what you say ever. Um, but from as far as I can tell, it was a military threat identification program. And so that's what we have. It wasn't something where there was a debate about the alien question. I do understand that UFOs might might be real is part of it. Um, but I think that people need to kind of be more straightforward and say, well, does it mean alien UFOs are real? And if someone wants to say that, you know, and one of the most disturbing things is to hear that military pilot say that from looking at something, you know, if there's aliens in it. So I would really like discourage anyone I know, or if I was having a, a real conversation with a real human being, and was telling them, hey, if you see something that's strange, don't just assume that there's an alien being inside. So, and I think that we're, you know, I, I have no doubts that in 2004, that FA-18 pilot saw something crazy. In fact, I know someone who flew with him from Lemoore, which is where he was dispatched, you know, because he wasn't dispatched from like the Nimitz. He was dispatched from Lemoore, which is just two hours north of where I live. Lemoore is a place where like we go and watch. There's <laughs> well, because you're a worldwide radio, let's just say it's it's just Lemoore. So there's an Air Force base there. Um, and I have no doubts what he saw was wicked. But, you know, I have I, – I still myself don't have any personal military people I've ever met who would recommend to you that if you see something, speculate that there's an alien being in it. But I do think that the credibility of that sighting and that uh, video – which we really don't know 
uh, much about like the way it's displaying or like where the ocean was. Right. So it is tough to see it exactly where it is, but from what he says, yeah, it was crazy. But I think they're kind of using that to make us believe other narratives. Um, so I would just caution people that they don't need this for their experience to be real. So, you know, what I do personally um, and what UFO seekers does is look for regular people. So, you know, it's not like on Monday morning for UFO seekers, because this is uh, like a job. It's not like on Monday morning, I go through a phone book and look for the next celebrity to talk to. So I'm looking for um, interesting places, um, places where UFO folk folklore is coming from. And then I'm looking for the regular individuals who are messaging me with their stories. So by email or by phone or by social media, I get um, incoming reports, videos, photos, and most of it, no one ever sees, but that's what we're following up on. And if we see something real, yeah, we might share it. Uh, but a lot of the times we keep it private just for civilian investigators. So if someone else has a UFO organization and they want to in, in, um, look at a case, that's kind of what we're doing now, you know, like in taking those and then holding them for other investigators. But, you know, and these people that we meet, these regular people, the experiencers, they don't need someone to justify themselves. So, and I just, you know, would like to instill like that confidence in them, you know, because there was more than enough people in the past um, who have done things for disclosure, you know, and, and especially Dr. Greer going in front of Congress. So I don't know how live streaming people who are in the government insiders was bigger than people actually sitting in front of Congress. So like the, the, I think like people are trying to equate it with things of the past and it, it's not, it's not similar at all. And in fact, the black vault has filed FOIA requests um, trying to get um, information about this so-called um, aerial threat identification program. And of course it's coming back, no records. And so also, um, you know, that's what we're looking for, right? We're looking for some confirmation because you can't hide things like in the American, um, in our government like that, you know, they, he would at least get something back saying, Hey, this is a program. It's all blacked out, but they came back, no records, you know? So I think we need more information and more FOIA requests. People need to file FOIA requests for uh, conversations between uh, Harry Reid and Bigelow. They need to file FOIA requests for commu uh, email communications between Elizondo and Tom DeLong and all these people that are involved uh, to try to find out more of what was what was really going on. So, you know, and in, and in fact, we've been asking on Twitter if people think we should go uh, like protest to get these so-called alien metals released. So, I, it's I'm just wondering, too, if, if people believe that this has been a true disclosure moment and right now there's alien metals in a building in Las Vegas, in America, it's you'd have to cough them up because any of these government programs are paid for with taxpayer money. So there's always accountability. And when you find out about a secret program, now we're talking about politicians who steal money. And we're not even talking about stealing money to like feed the poor. We're talking about stealing money to buy MUFON's case files, um, you know, and that's kind of what was happening. And so, you know, while I appreciate uh, what Tom and George Knapp have been able to do, I, I highly appreciate it because now we really know kind of what's going on. We, you know, a lot of us have, have really wondered about what's the main organization doing that's at the top of the UFO community food chain. Do they really have like the UFO community's interests in mind or is it just a financial gain and about making movies and having events? Um, so I really think people should just kind of just, you know, take a look at those things, but of course we're not out to press them. So I'm not making any videos about anything like this. I just left some breadcrumbs after doing some investigation. Um, and that's where above top secret, uh, picked up the breadcrumbs and wrote out the full article and story, you know, and that's what people can see that in, that in 2008 or 2007, this so-called program began. So 
Uh, from what I understand, in 2007, Leslie Keene was like trying to lobby Congress to do something about UFOs. In 2008, Harry Reid supposedly decides to start this program. At the same time, uh, MUFON in Colorado, all of a sudden their revenue jumps on the nonprofit financial disclosures, which you can find on the Secretary of State website um, for Colorado. And you can go look up uh, uh, MUFON's financial disclosures because they're a nonprofit, so they have to file the expense reports, uh, or not expense reports, but at least the uh, income and expenses. Um, and so we can see like an increase in their revenue. And of course, then we can see the James Carrion resignation letter from 2009. He was part of the MUFON board of directors and he decided to resign because he found out that one of the other board of directors, um, well, basically what happened was Bigelow had started a new National Institute of Discovery Sciences, basically, and it was called Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Studies something. So it was B-A-A-S-S. -S. And so now this was like a th second time of him having kind of an underground UFO investigation company, I guess, if that's what you'd call it, because honestly, no, no, nobody knows what's really going on. I mean, it's a military contractor, so we don't really know if these sightings are being taken and then put to military use. So are you taking the sightings and finding out what other militaries are doing, like in Canada, and then replicate the technology, or now you know the locations and where to find people? Um, so basically what happened was this BAASS made a deal with MUFON um, to start sharing investigations and also to get caseload from MUFON. And what MUFON didn't know was that this BAASS was actually getting its money from the government. So it appears as though it was actually taxpayer funds, which were given to a military contractor, possibly under the guise of investigating enemy military threats. But because Bigelow kind of had this, um, aerospace research company, they could kind of swing it and actually do UFO investigations as the aerial threat. Not exactly looking at it as, hey, this is a Chinese craft or a Russian craft, but actually doing like UFO investigations on the fringe, but not really telling anybody what was going on. Um, and so, you know, to keep in mind too, uh, anybody can go to Wikipedia and go uh, enter in George Knapp. And of course, you can pull up his biography and see that George Knapp was employed by Robert Bigelow in the 1990s and the 2000s. This is all located in the Wikipedia page. And he was employed by Robert Bigelow at National Institute of Discovery Sciences, which is the organization that bought Skinwalker Ranch. And so, um, you know, if people want to look at BAASS, one of the employees and people who's a part of it is actually the guy that wrote the book with George Knapp about Skinwalker Ranch, because this person is actually employed at Skinwalker Ranch too. And so there's just this huge cloud around everything that's going on. I mean, it's, it's literally like confusing, especially if you add in the fact that the above top secret article also showed that Robert Bigelow uh, in the late eighties was kind of the brainchild behind what came to be coast to coast AM. So there was actually some kind of like deal between uh, Mr. Knapp and Mo Linda Moulton Howell and Robert Bigelow himself. And they started a radio program called area 2000. Um, and also art bell became included. And then all of a sudden it turns into coast to coast AM. And so here you have like the biggest, the biggest, uh, the biggest media company, covering the UFO phenomenon and here's kind of this, uh, this, this billionaire behind it. And then you have uh, MUFON and it's kind of been infiltrated by this billionaire. And then you have like Skinwalker Ranch and it's owned by this billionaire. And then you have these kind of underground in uh, supposedly UFO investigation research companies like BAASS and National Institute of Discovery Sciences with employees of coast to coast AM, like working for these places. And I like seriously have like in my mind <laughs> to not throw out a pointer and like have a conversation with someone now in the UFO community and kind of not know like, where is this information going after I'm done talking to this person? So, um, I've totally stopped doing, uh, any type of like interviews. Uh, we don't care about like TV or, uh, radio, uh, just your show, Dave, because we really like Spaced Out Radio. Um, we'll do anything to help support you um, and help support your your listeners in this program. 
And so this is kind of like the only medium now where we kind of come and talk about, you know, delicate things like this. Um, so we don't post about it anymore or like do videos covering it because um, it's it's just gotten all too crazy. So, in fact, I think a lot of people kind of don't, don't know what to believe anymore. And I think that's OK, because there's no definitive facts. If it was disclosure an alien, alien, not UFOs, alien UFOs are real, why hasn't NASA accepted it? Like, why hasn't science books now? So am I supposed to understand that when I read, when my, uh, if, you know, if I had kids, if my kids open up their science books next semester, is it going to say aliens are real now in the science books? So when people say like, hey, there's this disclosure and it's done now, it's over, I, I, I don't see what they're talking about. Nothing much has changed. The people who did the real work were like Steve, Dr. Stephen Greer um, and Richard Dolan. I mean, those people did amazing work. I think they deserve recognition. Um, and anyone who's like working with the government and tells you, hey, these are insiders in the government, I think you should just be wary because, you know, those people are patriots and everybody wants to, everybody wants to take care of their country and their nation in their own way. And everyone does that. And it's, that's a good thing, but sometimes it's, it's not for some people, they're not really doing the right for the civilians from a civilian perspective. And that's where I'm coming from. I don't want the military perspective because when a rocket gets shot, like in Hawaii, it's the military that's hiding in a bunker that was paid for by the people's money, but the people are up on the surface and they're going to get hit by the missile. So I think there's this real line between joining with the military and joining with the government and not staying separate and things are really wishy-washy. So, and that's what UFO seekers is dedicated to doing, never joining and making our credibility uh, questionable like that. The case files and the things people submit to us will never get sold to anybody for any amount of money and not especially to the military. Cause I wouldn't want someone from Brazil sending me a video of a crazy UFO sighting or something. And then the military getting that and then going to that spot in Brazil and taking it. So I think people need to take that into perspective too. I mean, if we're talking about the transaction where um, the, the billionaire bought the Canadian UFO company, I think it was four separate websites that were purchased and all their UFO sightings and caseloads from Canada. I think that should make Canadian people kind of uneasy. I mean, that stuff should be held close to the cuff. I mean, if I have someone in here in California sending me a UFO sighting, I don't want to send it right to Canada because what if it's like, you know, a secret military craft from America? That doesn't make any sense. So, And we're going to get into that, you, gotta, you know. We're going to get into that in our number two, Tim, in regards to that. We only got about uh, three and a half minutes here before we go to break. I'm, I'm curious if you uh, could respond to something that, that Gail had here. You know, she actually contacted uh, MUFON today via email, and I'm just pulling it up here on Facebook, and, and she's curious your opinion on this, and... Oh, you got to love Facebook sometimes. So her question was, <laughs> I've been hearing frequently lately that the MUFON files containing UFO reports were bought by Robert Bigelow. I have not located what I consider a reputable source that states simply yes or no. Would you please answer this? Many of my friends and I in the UFO community would like to know. Uh, a gentleman named Roger Marsh from MUFON uh, responded back. And he basically said, Gail, no, the MUFON files have never been sold to anyone, including Mr. Bigelow. What are your thoughts? Uh, he can say whatever he wants, right? I mean, that's the whole point of the James Carrion resignation letter. So, I mean, if he wants to call James Carrion a liar, that's fine. So, and I think your, uh, I think Gail should reach out to James Carrion because there's always two sides to a story, and find out what's really going on. So, and uh, I think Gail should look up the financial reports for MUFON, and she should get some answers about the Star Research Team and why there was the increase in of revenue in the research team in the years the program was running, and when, 
in 2012 when the program ended, uh, Gail should ask why MUFON went out of business and then moved to California. So there's kind of a lot of correlations between the amount of revenue that the organization was taking in, and that's what people are interested in. So you have a board of director who resigned um, saying this is what happened. But, you know, I agree with Gail, too. The information isn't definitive. So that's why we never released a video. That's why we never published a full article. It's just information that we believe to be true. Because now we know that, I mean, she, she knows about the program now. She should go look up and read on, go look up and read on Skinwalker Ranch. I believe it's skinwalkerranch.org. Uh, That's where you can read about Robert Bigelow's organization working with the star research team in 2009. So she needs to start looking up that. So, and they were actually sharing investigations. So they weren't working, they weren't receiving any money and they can say whatever they want. But I would caution her too, that the new entity that's located in California is not the same. Uh, it's not the same anymore. They just use the name. So there could be different financial filings and they're not even lying saying, Oh, we didn't work with them or do it. But then you have again, so he's denying the John Carpenter incident. It's like, man, I don't even know what to say anymore. And you know, these people all have events lined up with each other. So why would they say anything? I mean, we all know that to the Stars Academy and, and MUFON has events lined up probably three years from now out. You know, and do they have people opposing it? I mean, isn't that funny too? Isn't it funny that all these mainstream UFO people refuse to have anybody who has an opposing opinion? So, I mean, if, if, you, if you don't believe, I mean, I don't believe aerial threat means UFO um, or alien UFO. So I'm, I've been blacklisted. You know, and that's what that's what a lot of people want to do. It's kind of a cult mentality. Um, anyone who's outside of our fringe of thinking is unacceptable and should be eliminated. Um, and that's where I'm going to stand. I don't believe the words aerial threat mean alien UFO. I believe it means alien th- or uh, aerial, aerial threat. threat. And on that note, Tim, I got to cut... until someone provides the government documents, documents that's, that's where it's going to stand. So. I, I got to cut you off right there because we got to hop out for our first break of the night. Tim Doyle from UFO Seekers is a monthly guest on Spaced Out Radio coming on the third Monday of every month. His next appearance will be on February 18th. Tim will be back for the next two hours as we talk UFOs, disclosure, aliens, media, and so much more right after this. Hey, space travelers, it's Joe Roop, your host of Spaced Out Saturdays. Come join me as we explore the realms of the paranormal, the esoteric, and everything in between every Saturday night at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. You know the truth is out there. Don't get caught sleepwalking. Come join Spaced Out Saturdays. That's every Saturday night, 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, right here on spacedoutradio.com. Psychic Sundays, Spiritual Communication, ET Contact, Sasquatch in Your Backyard. We will have it all on Cosmic Passport with me, Elizabeth Anglin. Each Sunday, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, at spacedoutradio.com, I will take you on a journey of enlightenment. The goal is learning from the soul on out. We'd love it if you joined our experience, Cosmic Passport, heard Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. 365 days a year, we're in the field, investigating UFO sightings, talking to alien abductees, and visiting secret military locations like Area 51. We're UFO Seekers, official partner of Spaced Out Radio. Follow our daily search for the truth at ufoseekers.com or like us on social media. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. From coast to coast to coast, Black Light Uncharted is taking on the paranormal across Canada. From ghostly hauntings to the UFOs flying above in conjunction with MUFON Canada, they're closely investigating what's going on in the northern skies and checking out the apparitions that walk among us. Check out our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. We want to know your thoughts, we want to hear your experiences, and we want you to share your stories. The answers are out there, and we intend to find them. 
Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members-only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. It's paranormal news at its finest. Welcome to The Encounter. At spaceoutradio.com, The Encounter Online is SOR's trusted news source for everything weird and strange going on around the world. This is news editor Eric Markham. Our team of journalists are scouring the planet for those strange stories that rarely make the mainstream. No fear-mongering or fake news here. Head over to spaceoutradio.com and encounter The Encounter. Want to learn more about aliens, cover-ups, conspiracies, cryptids, and the paranormal? All you have to do is tune in S4 as we take over the Spaced Out Radio Night, starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, each and every Saturday night, right after Spaced Out Saturdays. Hi there, this is Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. Join me, Corey Ruiz, and friends as we discuss the hot topics of the night. It's fun, entertaining, and as dark as the night. Find us at spacedoutradio.com. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy in your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? Are you an experiencer? Have you had run-ins with strange creatures you can't explain? ETs, Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolves? They're enough to scare the daylights out of anyone. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski from your Four Cop. And on the last Monday of every month, you can listen to me and the host, Dave Scott, talk about the weird and the strange being reported on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to bring my investigations and sources, you bring your experiences, and we'll figure out the rest together. Strange days on Spaced Out Radio. Come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com. There's a lot of strange going on in this world, and we can help you find out what's going on with you. Paranormal? Cryptids? UFOs in the sky? Aliens in your bedroom tickling your toes? We have the investigators you need to find out the answers you deserve. All you have to do is head to spacedoutradio.com. Your information is 100% confidential. The SOR Sightlines Report. It's free, and we're here to help. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our Advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media, have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag SpacedOutRadio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. 
Welcome back to the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, Jonathan Whitcomb is going to join us. We're going to talk two hours, the first two hours, about pterodactyls. Jonathan, a good Christian man, believes that pterodactyls are still flying around. He has the reports from all across the United States and the world. He's probably one of the leading investigators in the world on this topic. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time at spacedoutradio.com. We want to say hello to everyone on Periscope. Hi, how are you? As we are live on Periscope, we are also live on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia, home of the Walking Dead. We are live as well on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans and over 160 countries around the world. We're also live on the Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio to Las Vegas. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Head on over to freedomslips.com and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Agonoclite. Agonoclite is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, follow me at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to Spaced Out Radio. You go to YouTube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. We're right there. Hit that subscribe button. We would appreciate that we also have a gofundme account going on right now go to gofundme.com forward slash we own the night that's gofundme.com forward slash we own the night we would really appreciate you doing that as we try and build a new studio for spaced out radio and it'll happen very very soon and we appreciate your support i was thinking today with that what i think i may do is everybody who supported when we get the new studio built, I'm going to have like a wall of fame on there. And we're going to make sure that everybody who supported it, their name is going to go on that wall. So really appreciate that. Don't forget, you can also go to spacedoutradio.com to find a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for 5 bucks a month. You can rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store. You can also... I don't know, read up on the encounter, some latest news that we have going on. My latest blog on how Disclosure Affects Canada is on there today. And, of course, you can watch great videos from UFO Seekers and Contact TV. Tonight from UFO Seekers is Tim Doyle. Tim comes into Spaced Out Radio Land the first Make that the third Wednesday of every single month. And tonight we are talking about UFOs. We're talking about disclosure and seeing what is going on in that realm. Tim, welcome back. Thank you, sir. Always, always good. a pleasure to be on. Well, you know what? It's always exciting uh, when you come on because you never know where the show is going to go. And uh, it's going <laughs> to be very, very good. And I look forward to it quite a bit you know so we're going to continue on with it tomorrow night at spacedoutradio.com and every month with you at spacedoutradio.com and you know tim has a very very popular youtube channel that if you haven't subscribed to it yet you really should he he does amazing work just go to youtube Type in UFO Seekers. It pops right up. Hit that subscribe button. And it's very clean, very precise, very journalistic. And I would love all of our listeners to go out there and do that today. Not during this show, because you got to listen to us. But later on, after the show, go and, go and do that. Now, Tim, during the break, or right before the break, we were talking about MUFON and whether or not Robert Bigelow bought into it. We do know that he bought other Canadian and and uh, other UFO website domains and potentially the files on that. Now, I know as a Canadian, and I wrote my latest blog on this at spacedoutradio.com, I have a real issue with the with the thought that there is Canadian information going to a private UFO contractor 
of the United States government. And I look at that and I talk to a reporter friend of mine today about it who is going to be looking into it and him and I are actually going to be working on that story from a Canadian angle through FOIA requests up here, FOIA requests up here, as well as other angles as well. How important is it to know or for the public to know, Tim, that if Bigelow did in fact purchase personal files from these companies from these UFO websites, how important is it for the public to know that their information potentially could have gone into the hands of the United States government if they, say, live in a different country, like Canada? Yeah, and that's exactly, uh, you know, that just hits it on the head right there because that's what we're talking about is keeping these things safe from a civilian perspective and kind of from a country's perspective, so... I mean, I guess I could be, you know, hey, America's the best. I don't care if I get all your files, but I guess I'm more of like a humanitarian where, you know, I kind of have everyone's everyone's interests in mind, so I'm not comfortable. Um, You know, I'd rather see them go to a local Canadian organization and then they're deciding what to do with it. So, you know, I really think that there's a need for some type of global entity uh, to help monitor these kinds of things and to issue statements on these kinds of things and not, um, you know, isn't advocates. So, and I just want, you know, people out there to understand that, you know, there's, there's, there's movements that go on. And so, you know, we're not necessarily like attached to movement. So when we talk about disclosure, um, of course, we we all understand like what we're talking about, and hey, there's directions, and this is how it's moving. But you know, we're not advocates for a movement, so our decisions are based on analyzing facts, documents, imagery, pictures, and trying to make a judgment. Hey, is this an alien, or is this a true alien UFO? And so. You know, it's not like, hey, well, if A or B happens, then our movement moves one step forward. You know, we're solely interested in just what is truth and going at it from an impartial perspective. So I really think that there's a need for a global entity to step up, someone who doesn't do paid events with celebrities uh, as the main revenue generator for the organization but an organization that is strictly dedicated to protecting uh, case files, um, protecting um, regional UFO groups who are located in the separate uh, countries, you know, and of course, um, to it'd be nice to have like an organization who makes statements about events that happens, uh, events that happen. And it has to be an impartial group who isn't having, you know, events with Joe Blow so-and-so, who's this great UFO person, and they're having a symposium here and doing that. This group needs to be completely impartial so that their decisions aren't based on who they're going to make upset. And that's kind of what um, I think is troubling about the UFO community now is if, you know, you watch a regular newscast. They ask a question and you have someone from one perspective give their opinion and you have someone from the opposite perspective give their opinion. And so, you know, what's unfortunate for me is I'm not really allowed to give my opinion um, because I guess, you know, you, you kind of have to have a certain one to be accepted in the UFO community. So I think that is what kind of keeps us um, blacklisted. You know, it's because we have an impartial opinion. So, I mean, I I love Dr. Stephen Greer and think his movements are amazing. Um, But there's other times and maybe other things he said where I would bring it up and be like, hey, man, you said A A and B would equal C. And were you right? You know, so it's nice to have people who say, no, I I was wrong uh, or this doesn't happen. But I don't think people should just forget about claims that are made. Um, And if claims are made, doing what you're talking about and having a real uh, journalist investigate it, you yourself from your journalistic perspective, looking at it from an impartial perspective and trying to find out what does it point to, what was really going on um, and getting those answers. 
So um, I do think anyone should be um, at just a basic level in 2009 BASS and MUFON were doing investigations together. It may have been a short time, but that alone shows a military contractor was working with a nonprofit charity. So that's is what's what's scary about, you know, keeping these organizations shut off and closed from people who are willing to do that or people who would just willy nilly sell someone case files. That's I mean, it's absolutely scary. It's private information um, and people are, you know, they uncomfortably share it with you. They don't want sometimes they don't want it to just go out or be made in, into a movie or whatever. So, you know, I think there is kind of some. Um, respect that must be given to these things, but at the same time, there's value to these things. So if something can be found or um, a crash site can be located and we finally have an alien metal in our hands, then yes, you know, that makes sense. But uh, it's really good to hear that you were talking about uh, doing that investigation more. So I'm very curious indeed in regards to, you know, looking into whether or not he, you know, how much information on a Canadian level does Robert Bigelow have? And I think it's very important because considering the RCMP in Canada rep- uh, takes all of their UFO reports that they receive and they go directly to NORAD, then you add in the fact that someone like Bigelow and maybe others uh, who are contractors have bought into Canadian UFO websites. To me, you know, that's a lot of Canadian information because a lot of these websites will state on them that your information is 100% confidential. But what it doesn't tell you is it's only confidential to the website. It doesn't. It's not confidential as to whether or not we sell your files. And I know if I found out with all of my experiences, if we found out or if I found out that my personal information, my name, my address, my phone number, uh, my, my family's names, my email address, what I do for a living, and there's a lot of questions that get asked when you file a report, I would be some pissed off knowing that a foreign government or potentially a foreign government got my information because a private black ops contractor purchased it. I I would be absolutely livid because that's not what I gave the information for. It said right on the website, confidentiality. Everything is confidential. And... That, to me, is a giant, giant story. Because you know what? I can honestly say this. We have had Canadian experiencers on this show, Tim, who have come on. I think of Matthew Pauly, who has uh, been... He's from Toronto, and he states that he has been an abductee victim of MKUltra. I think of um, Miriam Delicato, who was followed after her UFO sighting. She was followed, harassed, after her UFO sighting and alien abduction here in 100 Mile House, where we broadcast. You know, afterwards, wow. I, I think of uh, the black helicopters that Karina Sables and her family saw. Canada doesn't have that equipment. We are a country that when it's time for budget cuts, our defense gets hit first. The only thing they don't cut is health care and education. That's the only thing that re- right. receives a raise every single year in the budget. Defense doesn't. And I never added it up together until I found out recently in the last couple of weeks about these files that have you know gone missing. We've had people on this show say they've been visited by CIA. Why the hell would an American alphabet agency come after someone in Canada where they have no jurisdiction. Right? Yeah, it's interesting. And and what are they looking for? I mean, but add it up too. If they already have like the alien bodies and they're holding those things, what, what are they doing? So sometimes I wonder if they're, you know, you have, uh, there's entities 
an, um, how do, how do you say it? I guess there's like a department inside the government and its job is to infiltrate in, industries. And I don't know if people know that, but our, go, our government and our military literally has an academy. Um, and I had a friend who actually is attending the academy. <laughs> Um, and their job is to infiltrate industry. So they actually go, they s- join the military basically, and they go off to this crazy um, building, um, just like a college. And that's where they learn the skill and then learn how to blend in and to get inside. And so it's a way for um, the military to pull information and then to control the direction and to also control money. And so that's, I think that's what has been exposed here is a way for the military to infiltrate the UFO community and point it in directions. And so I think people should be just very careful um, and just close to the hip, um, you know, and only talk to people you trust. (laughs) No, and and that's exactly it. And that's what we got to figure out. So like I said, I talked to a reporter friend of mine today and I'm going to keep him secret for right now, but he, we are going to be working on this story together. Because, in fact, if the Canadian government does know about this, that this information has been sent down south, and the Canadian government has been very quiet on the UFO front, then that could potentially, according to our Constitution, violate the Privacy Act. Even uh, though interesting to think about, yeah. Even though you know, but in some of the some of the research I did, it said that during this time, that uh, on the MUFON website, that the form the the terms and conditions had been updated to say that they now were spreading it or giving it uh, or sharing it with a third party entity. So I think that's something interesting for you to look up and see if that's really what was happening, and that's that's what I've heard. Well, I'll read you something here. Let me just pull it up here. So this is on the BC website, uh, hbccufo.org. So that stands for Houston, British Columbia, Canada, ufo.org. All right, so if you go to About Us, this was Brian Vike's website. Now, Rich Giordano, who has been on this show a couple of times, in 2004 and again in 2006, he actually submitted stories to Brian Vikes, hbccufo.org, research. All right, and now he is trying to find out, with his own stories, he's trying to find out whether or not those landed in the hands of Robert Bigelow. So this is, if you go to About Us, I'm going to say the website, because it repeats the website name a lot in this. It says, the website was founded in 2002 by Brian Vike. The website has processed thousands of sighting reports from North America and around the world. Through Brian's hard work and networking, the website became a very significant force in UAP reporting. Brian Vike and the website have maintained a consistent record of excellence over the years, which was evident in the very high traffic his website received. And we, the new management in brackets, Bass, Bigelow Advanced Aerospace Space Systems, are committed to upholding this successful tradition. We are ready to receive new cases. The website will continue the tradition of maintaining eyewitness contact information confidential. And then it ends by saying, we will not give your confidential or your contact information to third parties. Which, well... You don't have to give it to third parties, Mr. Bigelow, because you are the party. I, I find that very humorous. Do you see the humor in that line? It is the absolutely most crazy thing I've ever heard in my life, man. If I would have thought to, or if I could have even had the thought that when I started um, looking for UFOs, that I was going to find these things out about certain organizations. I couldn't never, I couldn't even like write this as an X-Files episode. I couldn't, <laughs> I don't even think Chris Carter could have thought this up, bro. No, I get, dude, I get you. 
I, I absolutely get you, and I think it's I think it's amazing when well of course Bigelow's not going to spread it to third parties. Who's he going to spread to? He's the man. He's the absolute man. Yeah, in this. and it makes you wonder because if any of this was happening, paid for with that taxpayer money, the things are pretty much property of the American people. So if there is these case sightings, if there is these alien metals, um, as far as I could see, these things would belong to the American taxpayer and they're being hidden. You know, and I just want people to think about this. You know, right now there's people claiming they hold the keys to the alien question, but they're not going to tell you. They're going to wait to tell you. And on top of that, they have the answer to the alien question, but they don't want to share it with you because I guess we're not on their level, you know, so it's kind of like a cult religion. And I guess when we progress to the third level grandmaster, uh, that's when these individuals will release the alien metals to us. And to take it from another perspective, if these people are holding alien metals, the American government paid for with taxpayer money has come in. They now hold metals from an alien race and have the secrets to the questions of the universe but we can't know about it and we're not allowed to have it. So honestly, personally, in anybody who believes the story, I don't understand why they're not protesting in Las Vegas right now in front of this supposed uh, Bigelow Aerospace place because the biggest name in the UFO community and a rock star from the 1990s are claiming the question to the universe lies in there. The answers to your religion, is there another alien race, are right there in Las Vegas, but nobody wants to go. So that's what makes me question it even farther, Dave, because I'm already planning to go there. I'm already planning to go protest and to find out if these things really exist. And I'll take it serious. If they seriously want to tell me that alien metals right now are in Las Vegas in a building, I'm going to look for the building and I'll publish a video on it for the people of the world who would like to know if aliens exist. And I promise you that I won't hold the video back until I write a book or produce a movie or want to write a CD about music, about aliens. No, I'll, I'll actually tell you because I, I think that all of us are passionate for the truth and not monetizing the question, you know, and that's what we do with the UFO seekers, if it ever makes any money, is to reinvest the money into searching, into equipment, into taking witness testimonies. It's not into profit for people to do other things with it and buy Porsches and Mercedes Benz and, you know, to have the golden life. I think there's lots of people out there and experiencers and the little guys whose testimony is irrelevant to these celebrities. Remember that. So the alien question wasn't answered by all the people we've ever talked to, including, you know, yourself who's had an experience. It's irrelevant to those people. So I think it's uh, very important that we focus on, on us, the little people. Um, and we're called civilians and the humans of the world um, and try to find the answers to these. So I would um, encourage anyone who'd like to participate in the protest to uh, email me, uh, Tim at UFO seekers.com. So we can set up a date and a time uh, to go protest outside Bigelow Aerospace. Uh, and I was hoping we could do it for like a week straight, sleep outside. Maybe we could even get a porta potty, um, you know, and hold up signs as the employees go into work. And maybe Mr. Bigelow will show up and we can get these alien medals that were paid for by taxpayer funds. So. Well, this brings to the next question of our conversation tonight. And that gets into the UFO media, the mainstream media, who, which I'm proud to say, isn't dropping the story. Just last week, Tucker Carlson on Fox News was talking with Leslie Kane about it. He has delved into this topic a few times, as has the big wigs at CNN, like Anderson Cooper, and Personally, I think that's fantastic that they're not letting the story go. However, I have a theory about this, and I'm curious about your thoughts on it. Okay? They are granting now, and they being the To The Stars Academy, 
are granting interview re- requests with all the mainstream media that comes and applies. They have yet, outside of Coast to Coast AM, granted any media interviews with fringe or alternative radio stations, whether it's this one, whether it's Clyde Lewis, whether it's Jeff Rents, whether it's Midnight in the Desert, doesn't matter who it is. Nobody from any of the fringe or people like Grant Cameron, people like Richard Dolan, they haven't got anywhere with with this group. Yet the mainstream media, who I strongly believed him, was caught off guard by this topic and the magnitude of this story is getting any request they want, whether it's uh, Blumenthal or Kane who wrote the article in New York Times, whether it's the pilot, whether it's Luis Elizondo, whether it's Chris Mellon. Okay, there's a number of people that the mainstream calls up. Yep, we'll arrange that interview. Not a problem. Good for you. But none of these mainstream sites, Tim, are contacting the real UFO researchers who've been doing this for a long time. We don't see interviews from by the mainstream with people like Stanton Friedman or Grant Cameron or Steve Bassett or Stephen Greer. We, we haven't seen it. And these are people who are supposedly in the know with their information. And my theory on that is because the mainstream media has been given Elizondo, they've been given Mellon, and from a journalistic standpoint, they've been given the two people who wrote the article along with the pilot. Therefore, they're saying, well, we've got these people, we don't need any of these researchers. But the main reason why they're doing it is because they were caught off guard. And what better way, when you're caught off guard in an interview, to get through it, even though it's intriguing, than to ask a bunch of what we call in the media softball questions. Those softball questions being like, what did you see? What did it look like? Are UFOs really real? How much did the government spend? Instead of asking the tough questions that the alternative media that has spent the last 20, 30, 40 years, some people, looking into this, need answered for the whole sake of disclosure. What do you think about the mainstream media's role in this? Well, I think, you know, like um, we had had a conversation before and you know, I'm right there with you. I think they're just very uneducated about the specific topic. Uh, so when they have a guest from it, I haven't seen an opposing opinion at all. It's just like you're saying, it's very one-sided. Um, and they just accepted it as facts. So for instance, in the Tucker Carlson interview, um, he did a lead in for the Leslie Keen segment before going to commercial. And then Leslie Keen came on after commercial, Um, And before going to commercial, he said in the program, they even found what might be alien metals and they still have them. And then when Leslie King came back on, they never asked about metals. They never asked about documents. They never asked to show a, a government document that says alien UFO. They never asked to produce a document that says we are looking for aliens. Um, They never asked for a document that says aerial threat program. Um, And so all we're getting is uh, military videos, which supposedly were for um, Air Force pilot training. And supposedly the DIA didn't know that the videos that they have were going to be used as UFO examples. And so I think there's just a lot of confusion. And, uh, you know, I think people should know that Leslie Keen works with Christopher Mellon. They serve on a board of directors at the company called UFO Data. And they can look that up. Um, In fact, Leslie Keene did an interview with Christopher Mellon before the announcement was made about the program. I think what's interesting about that specific interview um, that people can look up, I believe it was in the Huffington Post or the New York Times, um, Leslie Keene interviews Christopher Mellon. And Christopher Mellon laughs at the question of the government having medals in their possession. So Leslie Keen asks him if the government, it's going around that there's a rumor that they have alien metals and Christopher Mellon laughs at the question, but it shows that Leslie Keen already knew what was going on. Um, 
you know, so I think people need to be very, very careful um, uh, because the mainstream media isn't going to cover it seriously anyways. I mean, they laugh at it. They play X-Files music to it. Uh, the real confirmation is meeting an experiencer uh, face-to-face who's had like an abduction experience um, or seen an alien because anybody who says I saw um, a physical craft and then jumps to a conclusion that there's an alien being from another planet inside um, is just speculating because it's not proof. So having, uh, you know, getting abducted or seeing the physical being um, is a different story. So when we have a witness saying, hey, I, you know, there's aliens out there and here's why I saw one, you know, that's a little more compelling to me. So, you know, I really look at the stories of like Travis Walton um, and those abduction stories to really learn more about the alien topic, because I think a lot of times that lights um, that that we see or crafts that we see, or even a small tic-tac thing. Um, We've even seen an X-shaped craft that uses static electricity out of the air to move. There are just things in the air that people don't know about, and not everyone is privy to all the projects. So the F-18 Super Hornet pilot is speculating and basically implying that as a pilot, he is privy to every program from every contractor. And I find that hard to believe. And in fact, like for him to speculate on it is outrageous and it's hard to say anything because of his service in the military, um, which is very commendable and respectful. Um, but when we start debating, um, an intelligent question or a topic, um, our service or who we are is irrelevant. So unfortunately in the mainstream media, and I think with a lot of the UFO celebrities and elites that the size of your bank account determines the validity of your UFO sighting. What's your opinion then on the softball questions that have been going towards these players in this field, whether it's Mellon, whether it's Elizondo? Why do I think they're getting softballed, you mean? Well, I mean, the media, in my opinion, and I know you have thought about this too, really are not asking any hardcore questions. They're not, they're not asking the tough questions that need to be asked. They're just asking the simple ones, right? Like they're almost afraid to get into it. <laughs> right, but I don't think they, you know, they haven't studied the topic. I mean, it's like them interviewing a, a presidential historian um, who has like, you know, a bias on something. So. I think the mainstream media should, I mean, that should be a perfect example to show people they shouldn't just trust the media. Um, The mainstream media that we see on CBS and NBC and these big entities, because they're not necessarily concerned about the truth. It's just the next guest that the producers have booked. So it's not like, you know, every mainstream journalist or a mainstream TV reporter who claims to be a journalist is actually researching these individual stories. You know, it's just someone getting up there, reading a teleprompter, and like you said, just throwing some softball questions about a topic they know nothing about. So, I mean, to see um, on Tucker Carlson to not even ask the question of, how do you know if there's an alien being inside a craft you can't see into? is beyond me. And for him just to speculate that, Hey, it means everything's true. I mean, it's, it's just quite a leap. And I think it's just, it's intellectually dishonest. And if, and if all of these people are going to tout this as the new project blue book and do it out in the mainstream media, they better be ready when it, if it turns out not to be what they're making it out to be and the destruction they're going to do to this topic and the people that represent it. And the damage will last a decade. So I think, as with anything in life, source the information, source information somewhere else, and then make a claim, you know. And so, and that's the same thing that when it comes to, like, this this whole MUFON deal and this Bigelow thing, they worked with Bigelow in 2009. You can go look it up. It's everyone knows it. It's even on the Skinwalker Ranch stuff. It's undeniable. They're working with a military 
contractor accepting taxpayer money. That's undeniable. The fact that Bigelow had purchased those Canadian UFO uh, sighting cases and reports. He bought them from John Carpenter, who was a um, part of MUFON in the year 2000, 140 alien abduction cases. Yes, they may have been investigating UFOs, but in a fringe way. And I promise you, the military would not fund an alien UFO video program. The, the Pentagon would not fund a program for people to sit down and watch YouTube videos. That makes no sense. The military would have NASA send a probe up into outer space and comb the dirt off an asteroid and search for bacteria from an alien being. Now we're talking about something that's scientifically legitimate. So I just would caution people. The definition of an alien, like Project Blue Book, is not sitting down and watching videos or talking to a few uh, alien abductees. It's about actually posing the question of, are aliens real? And that's the definitive reason that the military was doing that. And that's why Project Blue Book is like the ultimate UFO program. I mean, did they need any more disclosure? There's a program that was actually looking for alien UFOs, but now, oh, this new program, hey, this was the one, but in fact, it proved there was nothing. The military shut it down because they found nothing, um, and Harry Reid didn't even vouch for it and just let the program collapse, but yet, hey, this guy who supposedly ran it and pushed the papers, even though we don't know if he was working on the project from 2009 to 2012 when it was actually going, we don't even know what the project's called because the FOIA requests are coming back with no names. So no one's telling the truth about what this program was named. No one's seen the bid that supposedly Harry, Harry Reid says exists. And it was a declassified program. So we're not even talking about classified topics. This program was unclassified. So now people are claiming alien metals from a faraway planet that had little green men in it and crashed on earth. And now Robert Bigelow has it in a Las Vegas warehouse because no one cares. It's declassified, but Hey, it would change the way uh, religion and Jesus Christ and all these other things. But you know, there's no one protesting there. I'm one who doesn't believe it yet. I'm willing to go there, go protest, try to get these supposed alien metals. I just wonder where everyone who believes it is disclosure, where they're at and why they're not protesting. So they must not believe it as much as they say, because they're just going back to work on Monday instead of going and tracking down this person or these people who are actually hiding the, the biggest questions in life uh, until they release their next book or, or music CD. <sighs> Why do you think the mainstream media then continues to not press on this topic when there's so much pressing that needs it? Do you think that they are afraid because they were caught off guard or because, like you said, there's another guest coming up and they got to prepare for that one next? Right. No, that's exactly it. So, I mean, I wouldn't expect... I mean, it is about impossible to get investigative, find investigative journalists these days. So someone's going to have to have like a, a fire set under their tush, you know, to do the legwork and the hard work, you know, the same way when we looked at the, to the stars company and did the video about the SEC filing. So anyone who wants to claim it's a UFO research company is a liar. There's actually a government SEC filing for the company. It's a book and music production company. So I mean, there's even articles out there that say this is a UFO company and this is what's happening. That's why everyone's getting deceived. Those are paid press releases. So, and I just caution people. There are PR firms who work for these people. Um, in fact, you know, we had to try to, we were told we had to use a PR firm just to get on um, one of the biggest radio stations here in the United States. That's a paranormal, you know, paranormal radio station. The only way they'd accept us is if we had a PR firm and then there was money that exchanged hands for us to purchase the time. Um, so I just caution people that there's a lot of money exchanging hands here. People are getting paid to write things. People are getting paid to say things and it's become very scary and it's really muddied the waters as far as who's not biased, who's in it together, who's trying to tell the truth. And who's trying to help someone sell the next book? I mean, who who can deny that uh, Luis Elizondo is working right now on his book, on his writing a book? Hey, that's what To The Stars Academy is. It's a book writing company. Hey, that's why George Knapp is working with Tom DeLong writing the Bob Lazar autobiography. I asked Leslie Keen and sent her a message. Hey, are you writing books with To The Stars Academy? It's a book publishing company and you're a book writer. 
and you can't get responses on these topics. So the, the, the real truth will be time. So either, either they're hiding aliens or they're not. Either they have alien parts or they don't. And the time is going to come when the truth will will out and we'll all find out what's really going on. And if it's not real, it was the biggest joke of all time. And the UFO community has literally become the biggest joke of all time. Do you think it's the biggest joke of all time or potentially could be? Or do you think that there is that hidden smoking gun that we need as a public to come forward and show that this is all real? It sounds like a debate that I would have inside of a religious facility. How can we figure out how to prove this religious book is correct? So I think people need to look at it as this is a fringe and an unexplained topic as far as we know, and there might not be that perfect evidence. And even if you had evidence, you can't convince everybody. I mean, if we found... You know, the Bible, it's got 50,000 manuscripts have been uncovered, right? So when we look at like a King Arthur or a king uh, who ruled like in medieval times, they, you know, uncover a manuscript that talked about his life. And then our history books are based on a singular manuscript that was uncovered inside of a castle. Yet if you look at the religious text um, of Jesus Christ in that Bible, hey, there's 50,000 manuscripts that have been recovered of these Gospels and the individual books. So which one becomes more believable, the one with 50,000 copies or the one with one copy written by one person? You know, and so, but yet people believe the King Arthur story more than they believe the Jesus story. So you're never going to have this definitive evidence. And, you know, people shouldn't need that. You know, it's almost like if we're going to feel good about ourselves, You know, when we wake up in the morning and you should look in the mirror and say, you know, I'm the biggest baddest there is. And I'm great. You know, like that uh, Al Franken on Saturday Night Live, Um, you know, and be confident with yourself and your own experiences. And you don't need someone to validate it for you. You know, you know, you've had it. You know, you've seen it. And you don't need someone on TV or someone somewhere else to validate that story for you. And that's what people like us are here to do. Um, is to help people uh, discuss these difficult things, um, maybe find resolutions, um, but to kind of keep them under the cuff and uh, develop like personal relationships because the, the topics are more important than that. So if someone's like getting abducted and they're having um, a terrible time like dealing with it, it's nice to have someone who you can just call and talk to. Uh, But it doesn't mean that he needs like Oprah Winfrey to go on TV and announce that aliens are real for him to know that his abduction is by aliens. So, you know, people just need to have that confidence with themselves. They didn't need anybody. And if they got confirmation, it was when Stephen Greer um, did his campaigns back in the day, man. That was amazing. Well, and I think that's that leads to another big part of this, Tim is literally since the uh, To the Stars campaign came out, the face of everything was Tom DeLong. Now we see the face being Luis Elizondo, number one, Chris Mellon, number two. DeLong, for his part, seems to keep on tweeting things out, but removing those tweets within an hour or two or less, and he has literally disappeared from the entire campaign that was going on, where just two months previous, two and a half months previous, he was the front man. Right, and I think that became, it was because of the holes in the story, you know, and that's the most interesting thing that the mainstream media keeps out, is that this two to the Stars company the CEO is Mr. DeLong himself. And so in an interview with Joe Rogan, um, he showed a CGI video of a black triangle on YouTube. He said that the government had recovered an alien body during the cold war. Um, and no one said anything. And at, even at one time he asked Joe Rogan, if he'd like to look at his private part. And he used a word that I can't say on the radio right now, you know? So I think they're just, became a point where the people who are involved with this story, if they don't want it to fall apart, that the narrative needs to remain perfectly uh, pointed in the right direction. And so that's what we're seeing now. You know, if you want any idea 
um, or business venture to be successful, you definitely need experts to promote it and experts to be the only people talking about it. Because who can deny the experts? You know, if they've got the PhD and you're just a high school diploma person, you know, you, where are you? Right. So that's kind of what we're seeing now is putting out, you know, the George Knapp who, you know, right. Is the God to everybody. Um, and then putting out these experts with a degree. And then this guy who was the front man of this program. And then who can deny that? So, and um, it's pretty solid, you know, the offensive line they have going is it'd be tough to beat if you're trying to get to the quarterback. So, you know, they put him out there. You know, he's like the quarterback hiding in the pocket behind the offensive lineman, right? (laughs) And that's a comment that I've heard from a number of people right now is DeLong, through that Joe Rogan interview, really shot himself in the foot. Right, and those were the answers I was looking for um, in any of the interviews that would follow up that one. Well, you made this claim. Gosh, if there's a UFO program, does that mean Elizondo didn't know that they had recovered an alien body in the Cold War? And like, why do you still make music if you know that the government has an alien body? Because I know myself, bro, if I found out the government had an alien body, I tell you, I'd spend 24-7 trying to find that dang thing. And I'd never go back to work at a job ever again. Um, So I think there's just real heartfelt questions. And so... You know, there's lots, you know, in the paranormal communities, in the UFO communities, lots of people make claims. And and I think that's okay. I think everybody likes the diversity of opinion. People like the diversity of claims. People like the diversity of theories. But when it comes to saying definitive things, then it needs to be truly questioned. If the alien question now and UFO question has been answered, why doesn't NASA and our science books reflect that? You know, if the mainstream media says UFOs are real, then why doesn't the, why don't the science books say UFOs are real? So it's, it's very, very confusing. And if they're hiding alien metals, why aren't the alien metals like given to everybody? If the company is for the public and you found something that would change your religions, I think maybe you think about just releasing it out there and not trying to make a quick buck off of. Uh, the medals, you know, Hey, that's like me. I mean, those medals I found from the stealth fighter crash. Why don't I just sell those? Right. <laughs> Jeez. But you have to understand though. I mean, I'm almost wondering if all of these UFO heavyweights were now thinking, geez, did we get into bed with the wrong guy because of some of those very questionable comments that a professional doesn't make on the air like he did on the two of the stars uh you know interview with joe rogan i mean like you said talking about you know flashing his penis and you know every every 10th word was the f word or something along those lines like having a conversation over a beer at the bar but when you're dealing with government officials you don't drop f bombs every 10th to 15th word you just don't there is a level of professionalism that is, you know, that has to go along with that position. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Dave, because I'm sitting here down in the United States looking at, you know, Stanton Friedman's and Stephen Greer's wearing suits and ties and going in front of Congress and our government is giving this person this, this person? <laughs> Dude, there is so... There is so many people in the UFO community you could have named who would be better representatives if this is a true disclosure. So I think it's just very, very disappointing, you know. I I mean, honestly, bro, I don't even know what to say. So, I mean, I don't have, like, any intentions of doing anything with anyone in the UFO community right now at all. In fact, we're definitely looking at expanding UFO seekers to have... um, regional groups that are controlled by a single entity, you know, so I think it's really time for someone to step up and compete against MUFON um, and try to get a, a real civilian lock of what is going on and cutting off the military, cutting off the contractors um, and ensuring that moving forward in the future that there is some type of legitimate um, representation for the UFO community, so... I mean, I think people can see that the UFO Congress has already booked all these UFO heavyweights. 
So there's no opposing opinions or people who don't like it or can speak, uh, you know, it's all biased, man. So I would just love to see like some type of global entity with representatives from like each country where, you know, all the things aren't getting siphoned here to the American military as far as like the sightings are concerned and definitely not posted instantaneously. I mean, think about how much, um, like the, the UFO stalker, right? Cause that's what everyone uses now to like, look at sightings that are happening in real time. I mean, how can you not, not manipulate it? So if I want to make Bakersfield a UFO hotspot, I can just go on there and start reporting sighting after sighting after sighting of black triangles and like make patterns and make hotspots. You know, so I just think that the ways that the things have been have been done and the way they're so accessible instantaneously um, leaves room for manipulation. And, you know, I just I really would like love to join up with some kind of like, uh, um, like I said, like worldwide entity that has uh, just a real passion for the truth and not a passion for dollars and cents. We only have about uh, a minute and a quarter here before we got to go to our final break of the night then. Do you think we'll see more of Tom DeLong, or do you think his days of being the front man to this disclosure cause is over? Oh, I'm sure we'll see more. So I have no doubts that they have, you know, more videos or more stuff to talk about and more opinions, you know, so, but. I'm really waiting for some FOIA requests to come back with some hard stuff so people can say definitively, yes, this is what was going on. And instead of us just relying on people's opinions and making that fact through the mainstream media. It is going to be interesting times indeed, Tim, uh, because, you know, I'm, I think everybody needs to be watching how long Tom DeLong is out of the picture. I think that's very... I know, but think of this, right? Think of this. Everyone who uh, right believes it, I mean, you should be excited because this year, George Knapp and Tom DeLong are going to unveil alien medals. So how great is that? So, right? So I think everybody should get out their champagne and put on their their New Year's hats and wait till the moment when they unveil the existence of aliens. Just like Harry Reid said, right? They have scientific evidence. So I think that's what we're all waiting for. You know, and then everyone can beat their chest. And on that note, buddy, I'm going to get you to hold on. We are going to hop out for our final break of the night. Tim Doyle is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. Tim comes on the third Monday of every month in a show that we call UFO Seekers. His website, ufoseekers.com, a very popular YouTube channel, UFO Seekers as well. I highly suggest you check it out. Coming up, hour number three and Thought of the Dave later on. We'll be right back with more SOR right after this. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. There's stories, then there's the truth. Do any of us really trust the news anymore? This is Jamie Sexton, owner of Rebel Planet News. The third Thursday of every month, I appear on spacedoutradio.com to bring you the truth you deserve without mainstream media lies or alternative media fear mongering. We'll get to the heart of the story and deliver the truth you're seeking. So come join us here for the Rebel Planet at spacedoutradio.com. We're lighting the void on Saturday nights on Spaced Out Radio. Hey, this is Joe Roop, and I'm hanging out in SOR headquarters every Saturday night, bringing you the latest news when it comes to the weird and strange. Bigfoot, occult, UFOs, ghosts, and everything in between, I got you covered. You can tune in to spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Come travel into the void with us on Spaced Out Saturdays. Not ready for bed on Saturday night? Right after Spaced Out Saturdays, hop on over to S4 with Corey Ruiz and me, Eric Cooper from Forest Moon Paranormal. With S4, there are no limits to what we try and uncover. 
from government conspiracies to help you clean up the paranormal. No topic is safe on S4. We get to the heart of the matter of the subjects you want to learn more about. So tune in on S4 starting at midnight Pacific, 3 a.m. Eastern, only on spacedoutradio.com. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Witkowski's Strange Days. This is Eric Markham, news editor for the Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter Online. We have put together a great team of writers and journalists from all over the world to bring you top quality paranormal stories, from alien encounters to the latest conspiracies. You won't find any of that fake news here. True stories and top notch reporting as we look to bring these experiences to the mainstream. The Encounter Online, only at spacedoutradio.com. Do you want to know the truth? Do UFOs exist? Are aliens real? Are the governments hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO seekers, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow along with us as we journey across the United States, visiting UFO hotspots and alien hotspots, trying to document the UFO phenomenon. Catch us on Spaced Out Radio every third Monday of the month as we discuss Area 51, UFOs, and more. And also, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Don't have time to listen to Spaced Out Radio Live? Wherever you are, the car, the office, the shower, or even if you're traveling, we're right here for you. Each Spaced Out Radio show can be found on iTunes, TuneIn, and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. It's the perfect way for you to catch up on our shows. For more information, just head over to our website, spacedoutradio.com, and tune in to us today. There's a lot of strange going on in this world, and we can help you find out what's going on with you. Paranormal? Cryptids? UFOs in the sky? Aliens in your bedroom tickling your toes. We have the investigators you need to find out the answers you deserve. All you have to do is head to spacedoutradio.com. Your information is 100% confidential. The SOR Sightlines Report. It's free, and we're here to help. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. It's Cosmic Sundays with me, Elizabeth Anglin, in Cosmic Passport. Let me take you down a three-hour spiritual journey where we will get into everything from ET contact to Psychic Sundays. It's a journey of listening and learning together with some of the best professionals in their fields. You can tune in to Cosmic Passport at spacedoutradio.com every Sunday starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter 
at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, Jonathan Whitcomb is going to join us. We're going to be talking about pterodactyls. Yes, pterodactyls. He believes they still exist. We haven't had Jonathan on in almost three years on this show, so we're going to find out about pterodactyls tomorrow night. At spaceoutradio.com, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern Time. We want to welcome in everyone listening in on WQEE 99 Rock the Key down in Noonan, Georgia. We are also live on the United Public Radio Network, 107.7 FM in New Orleans, and over 160 countries around the world. We're also live on the Fringe FM, Renegade Talk Radio out of Las Vegas. And if you're listening in on Revolution Radio, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station. Finance by you, the valued listener, head on over to freedomslips.com or revolution.radio and donate today. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Agoniclite. Agoniclite is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, Space Travelers, as Bill sets a password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Now, if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can also follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott SOR. As of last week, we just started broadcasting nightly on Periscope. Hi, Periscope people. How are you? Watching on in as we broadcast live. Hope you're enjoying the show. And our web our, our website for our archives is on YouTube. Go to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. So that's youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. We would absolutely appreciate that as well. You can also listen to us on iHeartRadio in the United States, talk stream live, tune us in on TuneIn, download and subscribe to our shows on iTunes, our website, once again, spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including joining the SOR Space Travelers Club for five bucks a month, rock out to some Bumblefoot, shop at our Spaced Out Radio store, read up on the encounter online, or you can also watch great videos from UFO Seekers and Contact TV and so much more at spacedoutradio.com. Tonight our guest, as he is the third Monday of every month, is Tim Doyle from ufoseekers.com. And you can obviously catch his videos on our website as well. Tim, always good to have you back on the show talking some UFO action. How you doing, buddy? Uh, most excellent down here in California. I got to tell you, man, it's awfully warm out up here. Awfully warm. We've had a quick change in temperature in my knees. I got bad arthritis in my knees, and my knees are letting me know right now. I'm in pain right well, now. Well, you should be comforted to know that I am in shorts and a t-shirt, and I'm sweating. I am in a sweater and jeans. That's how warm it is. It's above zero here. Not supposed to be above zero at this time of year. I want minus 30 Celsius. That's what I want. I want minus 30. I enjoy minus 30. Going outside where you're out grabbing a pile of wood, and all of a sudden, you know, you're outside, and within seconds, the tips of your fingers feel like they're going to fall off. Now, that's winter, man. That's winter. That's what I'm talking about. I have no idea what that feels like, but if I did, I'd say it's terrible. Yeah, yeah, it does suck. Not going to lie. You can't even, you know, you can't even go outside and play hockey on the lakes right now because it just screws up the ice. It just absolutely screws up the ice. So you can't even go outside to play some hockey or skate around, but that's okay. That's very much okay. Do you actually go out and skate on, like, lakes or ponds? Yeah, man. You can pretty much ice fish at every lake around here right now. You ever get scared that you're going to be out skating and, like, fall through the ice? Oh, sure, why not? But, I mean, it's part of the game, man. (laughs) You got to go where the puck goes, that's for sure. (laughs) Uh, That's 
pretty cool though. You could just like run out the front yard and play some ice hockey or what? Yeah, it, pretty it, it's it, it's pretty good. I mean, you know, I mean, my little guy is four, so you know, I give him a couple of cross checks when he grabs the puck. You know, I'm sure he'll lose some teeth here pretty soon. You know, teaching him the good Personally, old Canadian I'd be way. Playing, I'd be playing that game, bro, with the brooms where you like launch the little heavy weight and it like slinks down the ice and you got the guys with the brooms brushing off the ice. Curling? What game? Yeah, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. I could live on, if I go to heaven, I'm going to do curling and bocce ball my whole life in heaven. See, I can't wait to go fishing. I can't wait to go fishing. I've never ice fished. I gave Bazooka Joe from our chat room crap yesterday because he told me, or last night, because he told me he went ice fishing. I'm like, where was my phone call? I said, that's not fair. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, it's pretty we cool. We saw some people ice fishing on uh, ABC News, or, yeah, I think it was ABC News. And uh, the Martha lady went to South Korea to ask him about Kim Jong-un, and she went to an ice fishing festival. So we were watching... Uh, a huge South Korean ice fishing festival. It was pretty cool. <laughs> so let's get back to the UFO talk because we could uh, we could literally uh, talk about uh, ice fishing in the cold in Canada here because I don't mind shipping some snow down your way, you know, if you want. But I mean, let's let's sit here and. Um, and talk a little bit more of the UFO aspect. With everything that has happened, Tim, since the original announcement with the F-A-18 pilot, do you believe that um, we are coming up to the future where we're going to get more releases and more videos? Because, let's face it, they're going to want, whether it's Tom DeLonge or the government, they are going to want you know, to keep the ball rolling on this. And they're going to have to bring out new information if they are going to continue to keep the presence in view of the public. What? When do you think they're going to start probably releasing the rest of these files that they have? I'm sure they're just letting the uh, the press... Um, power wear off, you know, because stories kind of only last for a certain amount of time. So I think they're just kind of waiting for it to die down and for the need to generate the more traffic. And then I'm sure that's when we'll see releases coming out. Do you expect to see more military vi- videos or do you think that it will come to a point, Tim, where we start seeing some personal videos as well? Um, you know, I don't know about that because now we're talking about, you know, I don't know how those things would be acquired. So if we had like the U S government supposedly releasing a private citizen video, that's, that's kind of weird. Like, I don't even know how something like that would kind of be re-released by somebody else because typically when things are getting released it was something the government shot so you know because the way it works here like in the united states if the government films anything um if it doesn't have someone's face in it right or we can't see um, a soldier's face it's there's unlimited copyright for u.s citizens so i can take that picture of whatever it is you know, if a U.S. Navy guy's on an aircraft carrier takes a picture of a jet in the air, um, I can use that photo however I want because it was my money that paid for the picture because it's a taxpayer-funded picture. Um, and that's kind of how all things work here in the U.S., right? And that's why we have that awesome Freedom of Information Act um, to give us that next transparency level. Um, which is supposed to eliminate confusion like this, you know, so if people are interested in something, hey, file your FOIA, and there you get your information. So um, I'm just more interested in the FOIA requests and what they come back with. So I just, I want to know if it was a military threat program looking for enemy craft, or if it was a program looking for alien crafts. And that's like one question I've never heard because as far as we see from the study, the study said there was no aliens or they weren't looking for aliens. So there was no contemplation on the question at all. 
because they were just looking at military threats. And if they were just looking at UFO videos, I don't know how they'd identify military threats from someone's video of seeing lights in the sky or having um, a close encounter in a physical experience. Um, I don't know how the military puts a value to that. So, um, you know, typically the military's like expending resources on things that bring back a value. So if they were just analyzing videos to look for military threats, that's probably why it ended up going down. Well, let's get to the point then. Do you think we will see clearer video footage on the um on television and released to the vi- to the media because that first footage it's very tough to decipher what it actually is yeah well i've had people um tell me <coughs> um but not identify themselves that there are videos coming out and the videos are better um so yes i would expect that to happen <clears throat> so do you think we'll get close ups tim like, I realize this is all speculation, okay? But they got to give us more than grainy video that looks like some blob squatch on TV. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. And that was kind of like, <laughs> I mean, that's the frustration of the UFO community as a whole. There is there is some good videos, but videos don't get taken in the mainstream as evidence, so... You know, that's what's, it's, it's funny if you have a perfectly clear UFO sighting, but because you live like in a mobile home park, it's not accepted, but because a military guys flying in a plane and believes an alien was piloting a thing he saw. And yet everyone believes the military guy. That's what's strange to me. So, you know, if I have like a stranger walk up to me say, Hey, I want to tell you something I've never told anybody before. This is my encounter I had with like an alien or an abduction or a UFO sighting. It's spoken clearly like, Hey, I had a transparent sphere. Um, and that was one of our latest videos from the Sierra Nevada mountains is an individual who had, a uh, like a three foot sphere come over his head and hover above him while he was fishing. And then the sphere kind of glided at a couple miles an hour out over the pond and then eventually shot up into the sky. And he could see through the sphere, perfectly circular, nothing in it, um, no observable way for it to have propulsion. So I don't understand why that's not as acceptable as someone flying at a plane at, a, at hundreds of miles an hour who sees see something and says automatically, Hey, there's an alien inside yet. You couldn't see through it. Um, it has kind of the same dimensions of what's known as the Lockheed Martin ICBM kill vehicle, which is something we've shared, um, on our Twitter account extensively. Um, but basically it's, a like a two to three foot wide object. That's a drone and this flown autonomously and has, you know, 10 to 30 jets, small jets that are just inches in length, and they all point in a different direction. And so the object is like, it's a cigar shaped, like three foot long cigar shaped object that can hover in a position and it can move like nothing you've ever seen before in every direction, just like a space satellite would. Because like a satellite has the different thruster rockets pointed at different directions but it has like one at a 45 degree angle you know one at a 90 straight up this thing has many rockets that point in every direction so it can move in every direction and it was meant to be an autonomous drone that could fly through the atmosphere then into space and be able to work in both and bring down um, a ballistic missile that was in space or inside the atmosphere So I just think that there's projects. I mean, and that was even done by the Japanese Defense Agency. They had one just like it. So I don't understand how a U.S. military pilot can know every black project of every country out there when there's just radical, real projects of real things. And that's why I'm saying, like, there's such a difference between someone who says, hey, I've seen a being or been abducted by a being can draw it out for you. Here's the color of its skin and a freckle it had on its forearm. Um, 
but yet a heads up display of something I can't even see what it is, that's definitive evidence. So, and that's, that's very confusing. And I think very um, disheartening for a lot of the small guys out there. So, and I think it's, it's been um, very devastating to those people, I think, and to the organizations out there that are doing hard work, especially to like the individual MUFON um, members who just want to be like investigators or to a local organization um, who doesn't have these PhDs or these, you know, military insiders or people with fancy titles. They're just real people who are passionate about it and meet experiencers and want to document those things. Um, and so I think those people um, and their their credibility is damaged by everyone saying you've got to have a fancy title and and have a suit and tie on and be led by this person or else you don't count. And the people who you talk to, they don't count. I mean, and so remember that too. If I go out and meet a military pilot who wants to tell me a story, it's going to be discounted because I'm not part of so-and-so organization. Um, but I would um, refresh in people's minds that that, that, F-18 Hornet sighting, like, wasn't new. In fact, um, Air Force pilots I know have known about it forever. Um, and then it was on above top secret, supposedly. There was some uh, German students, I guess, who were doing, like, a study on it in 2014. Um, so it's something that's been around. Um, but none of those people ever claimed it was alien, which it could be, right? But we don't know because we don't want to speculate. So the best we know, it, it could be something strange, but at the same time, it could be something manned. Um, so I think that's more of a rational conclusion rather than saying the heads up display video is definitive evidence of a, of a little green man inside that object. That's what doesn't make sense. And I don't understand why any of these, um, while, why in the second video, like the object doesn't want to try to outrun the F-18. So I think everyone should take note that the F-18 Super Hornet is the ultimate UFO chaser. So that's. <laughs> well, it only does one Mach 1.8. So, you know, not that fast <laughs> compared to a UFO. Hey, let's get to a couple questions from our audience here. I want to start off on Twitter with Andrew, who is asking out of Vancouver, have you considered, Tim, whether the soft disclosure of December 2017 New York Times article was necessary because there is a timeline for real disclosure? Maybe there is a drip, drip, drip process to prepare people for the real event that may have been ritually timed. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, personally, I think people just want to sell books. So, I mean, and I would uh, caution anybody who's like a scholar of things like uh, um, the Judeo-Christian Bible. There's always kind of this fanatization with the uh, uh, Book of Revelations and the Armageddon that's kind of always around the corner. Um, so I don't think it should be viewed like that. You know, I mean... We don't even know what we're talking about when we're talking about UFOs and what kind of disclosure are, are we wanting? I don't, so I don't know if this is, if it's like a movement towards a goal. Um, is it that the government's hiding aliens and that's what they're finally going to expose? I mean, all I would know if that's true is that right this second, all of us are both believing in, um, religious stories and living a way that could be changed if we had the knowledge they have. So it really makes me feel cult like um, that there's people on the inside who are controlling all the truth and they're even so weird about it. They reach out to Hollywood celebrities to drip feed it to the people who paid for it. So it's, it's, it's very confusing. All right, let's get to another question. This one comes from Willie in the Spreaker chat room who is asking, Tim, what's the best UFO evidence you have? Hey, Willie. Uh, you should check out the video, and it's called uh, 100% Photographic Proof of UFO, and you can find it on our YouTube channel. And basically it's a cloud-like object that is coming from the sky and going into a canyon. And so remember, too, I'm just saying it's a 
an unidentified object, but not saying it's alien or trying to imply that you're looking at something that has an alien sitting inside of it, like a little green man. So all I'm saying is that this object we captured is like nothing we've ever seen. Um, and it's definitely up for debate as um, to its origins. But in that video, you can see it's somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 feet wide. And it's an object that can't be seen or can't be heard. So Tracy and I were up on a mountain at about 8,000 feet. And we're looking down into a canyon, uh, multiple canyons. With, with a river at the bottom down at about 4,500 feet. And so we're pretty high up looking down. Um, and that's where we caught two pictures in a series of rapid shot pictures. So the camera we were using is a Sony DSLR. We had it on rapid shot and we took a series of, I believe, seven to eight pictures. And in two of them, the object was captured. And also in the background is two other similar looking objects way down in the canyon, but smaller. So it's almost like there was a group of objects out there that you couldn't see or couldn't hear. Um, and moving at what is probably a supersonic speed without even making noise. I've seen that video and that video is... I a lot of fun, a lot of fun, and <laughs> dude, that thing it, it, it looks it, it's like trippy. a devil face or something. No, I fully agree with you. It looks, it looks so real and surreal that it's like. And the weird part about it is, in that video, they ha you have jet fighters flying around at different times. So it's like this this UFO or whatever it is is right in the middle of all of these fighters that are flying around in the in the air at the time, right? Correct. Correct. And going in the opposite direction of the traffic. And so here in the United States, if you look at like pilots guides, and of course I study like the pilots guides and the sectional charts um to understand the airspaces I'm in. And of course being a drone pilot, you're supposed to check that stuff beforehand. That area is actually called the, the Lake Isabella uh, MOA. So it's military, like operational airspace, basically. And so that's where you'll get at certain times of the year and certain seasons, uh, jets will be flying in there from the Air Force or the Navy. And it's part of a training route when they want to simulate flying in high elevation mountains because that area and that river eventually ends at Mount Whitney. Um, so if you just go north of the location we're at, it's actually the tallest part in the continental United States at over 14,500 feet, I believe. And so that's what they're doing in that canyon. They're flying and following the river, um, which actually turns into a national park. So that's kind of funny here in the U.S. They use like national parks and national forests for military activities. And they end up flying almost to Mount Whitney where they make a right-hand turn and they go down over Owens Lake. And then they make their way into Death Valley through Father Crowley Point, which is also known as Jedi Transition, where you can find photographers taking close-up pictures of jets flying in a deep canyon from about 100 feet away. And then they make their way down into Death Valley, into the bottom of a valley, and they turn right and go by Ballarat Ghost Town at about 500 feet to 1,000 feet above the road. So if you're ever looking for a good road trip, go drive down the valley where Ballarat Ghost Town is, and you might have a jet fighter fly overhead at about 1,000 feet. Um, and then from there, they make their way down into Fort Irwin or uh, the China Lake Naval Range. And so that's what we, you know, and knowing all of that, this object was going in the opposite direction that air traffic goes in. And so that's what didn't make sense either, is that if this is some private contractor testing something secret, it's going in the wrong direction. So like they were, what are they doing? Um, but if it is something alien, like, or paranormal, because uh, for instance, Tracy and I were just up in that area uh, two days ago and spoke to an individual who had a cloud orb experience in the same place. And he was at a friend's house uh, during the day and the um, the friend runs into the house and goes, hey, there's a cloud ball following me outside. 
And so the guy goes, dude, what are you talking about? And, and looks out the window and there's like a cloud ball floating outside the house, like a three foot ball you know, that isn't like solid. So it doesn't just have like a solid outer cover. It actually has like a cloud, like transparent outer edge. There is no edge to it. It's just like a mist, like a cloud mist ball where the center of it, you can't see through. And that's what you're seeing in like the pictures we captured is like this cloud object. And so uh, the gentleman says that they got all scared and they ran to the other side of the house and they looked out the window and the cloud thing came to the other side of the house and was just hovering outside like 10 feet away um, from the wall of the house outside and then immediately just shot up in the air and left. And there's no sound. Um, there's no like sonic booms or anything like that. There's no evidence that there's some type of individual, heck, a person couldn't even fit inside of the object. Um, and so with these kinds of stories, and we have a few more of a similar cloud-like orb experience in this area, there's the object. So whether or not it's military, I don't know. Whether or not it's alien, I don't know. But that's not what UFO seekers ever wanted to do, was, hey, prove... Um, that aliens exist necessarily. We want to just be impartial and try to catch things and go, here's what people are seeing. And that's kind of what we do in our videos. We get reports from individuals um, and those reports stay under the cuff. And then we go and try to investigate and see what people are seeing using the same kind of visual light in the same places at the same times. And, th and that's what we're interested in is helping people understand uh, what could be out there. Um, but jumping to a conclusion about um, its origin, is it, it's literally impossible to know. I mean, it's fun to speculate, and it's great to speculate, and people do have theories, um, but that's not kind of the avenue that, that I'm looking to go down. Kat is asking in the Spreaker chat room, Tim, as to why you don't classify that X craft that you saw as a UFO. What do you think, then, it is? Um, I've, <laughs> that one is like the craziest one ever. I don't know. I'm, I really only want to like stake reputation on things that I am sure of. And I don't know if that isn't like a military craft. Um, we did have a person from uh, Northrop Grumman send us an email and say that that is like a gaseous filled craft um, that has a small electronic box and like a antenna system for a controller. And it's like a surveillance drone. So it's something that is like dropped over an enemy airspace and can kind of just float around. And trust me, when that thing is sideways, you can't see it barely. It looks like a little stick. You know, because it's X-shaped when it's turned one way, but then when it turned the, when it was straight the other way, you couldn't tell what it was. It looked like a jet man, it looked like a man with like a jet pack just like floating through the air. Um, but but this person said like, hey, it uses static electricity that it pulls from the natural atmosphere, and then you know uses that as energy to manipulate how it moves. And because it's gaseous filled, it's lighter than air, which makes the static electricity propulsion possible and especially if it was lighter than air then you could use that static electricity as enough propulsion because you don't have too much mass or weight in the object so like literally the only reason i don't say it's a ufo is because of that person saying that does it mean that i trust that person for it to be what it is i don't know like can that thing move faster than how we saw it i don't know what I do know is that it came over a mountaintop, <laughs> went down into a valley, which is actually on the uh, pilot's guide sectional charts. You can look it up in the public sectional charts is a section that says unmanned airspace. And like we said, it was during the Super Bowl, during a large media event where people are all glued to the TV. Hey, who wouldn't be? The Super Bowl's freaking awesome but I'm trying to do the UFO thing. So that's what we're spending our time doing. And we're out there in the unmanned airspace. This thing comes over a, like a thousand foot hill that we hiked up down 
into a valley that is the unmanned airspace where you have targets set up like fake airplanes, fake buildings, and then turns to the left, not with the wind, and then starts floating up into the air towards Edwards Air Force Base main facility and goes up into the air um, over the Air Force Research Laboratory, which is covered in one of our videos called uh, Unexplained Lights at Air Force Research Laboratory, right? Because that's what's at Edwards Air Force Base and, and then disappears. So, you know, maybe it is like a UFO or an alien UFO, but, you know, I... I really trying to like have an impartial credibility and like hopefully someday be someone who can get invited into the mainstream media to help talk about some of these subjects to give differing opinions or uh, maybe like a, a stabilized opinion, you know, and not being an advocate for um, like I said, for a specific position, because once, you know, Hey, I'm saying, these things are real or this is real, then I have no choice and I have to push a position rather than go towards the truth. And so if the truth means that there isn't aliens, dang it. Like (laughs) that's not what I wanted out of it. But if the truth is those things are those things, that's what I was counting on MUFON to find out about and be so diehard to look in to some, to people like us being credible Because I think a lot of the times with UFO sightings, it comes down to the individual who's recording it and the credibility of that person and the, the, not the speculative claims or theories about it, um, but being truthful about how it's captured, um, doing it for that purpose, not expanding on speculative theories about what the origins of it are, but then giving it off to scientists who can then do analysis and try to nail down specifics, even if they know about classified projects or not. So um, that's why I'm like very, very like adamant about someone being like a big scientific representative to analyze things like this, you know, because I really do feel like that is the one not not the X, but the cloud-like orb thing is truly something, truly. And literally the day the story broke about um, the, the MUFON Bigelow thing was literally the day I was going to submit the cloud photos to MUFON. And once I did that, I lose all rights to them because MUFON makes you – lose all rights. They can do whatever they want with the photos. They give them to everyone. They use them to make movies or whatever. And I was willing to, to part with those pictures. And then that story broke. And that was at the end of December. And it literally broke my heart because I literally thought that at this point in time, at, in this month in January, I'd be giving you a case number and they'd be investigating my um, evidence and we'd be talking about trying to find something scientifically legitimately captured by someone who was trying to look for it because of witness reports and not just taking like some kind of grainy or blurry thing that no one knows where it came from. No one really truly knows unless you filmed it and then saying, Hey, you know, that's, it. that's disclosure. So, you know, I think that's, what's been frustrating for us this whole this whole time is now we're wondering, Hey, what the heck are we even out here doing? If no one really cares about the truth, you know? No, absolutely. Tim. I think it's, I think it's absolutely right that, I mean, we got to figure out what that truth is, but the one thing that has been a big part of what has been going on with not only the To The Stars campaign, but what Luis Elizondo has been saying lately too, is they are really trying hard to separate what UFOs are from aliens. They're a complete 180. Now, my own personal belief in that is it's easier to make people focus on UFOs Because people are scared of aliens. They're not scared of UFOs, if you know what I'm saying. Everybody will go outside in the sky, wow, look at that, look at that, that's cool. But they forget that there's probably someone piloting that. And I'm just wondering, you know, in regards to alien life and whether or not they are here, if we should be separating them and segregating the two topics the way that this is all coming out to play. Right. And that's exactly what we've done. So like, for instance, our case system doesn't 
um, accept alien reports. Like alien reports are done differently. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's more of like a personal relationship because now we're talking about something that could be like psychologically damaging to someone or this person, like it needs to be taken serious and documented differently. Um, and I agree with you, you know, it's clickbait to just say UFO is clickbait to not say alien UFO and to leave people in innuendo as fact. That's the whole issue. If they're saying, Oh, this was the alien UFO identification program. That would make sense. But when you say aerial threat, that makes no sense because are you telling me that like if aliens came, they're a threat. Like if our creators in a little ball of energy, he's a threat. Like that makes no sense. So now you want to tell the public to be scared of what's up there. That makes no sense. That's when you start believing Dr. Greer's theory that this is a scare tactic to make people scared of aliens. And I agree with that a hundred percent. Nothing out there is, shouldn't scare you. You should want to go out and go look at the sky or go to area 51. Don't let their scary stories, you know, and the scary thing of the skinwalker ranch because if you're going to go there you're going to die don't let them scare you in your life live your life as a champion go to these places and see it for yourself go stand out at area 51 in the middle of the night and tell me if you get attacked by an alien there are hot spots but when experiencers have things happen it's randomly in random places i mean it's impossible for us to dig up a reoccurring something so that you can go there and prove it because that's what would happen. If an alien being kept going to the same place over and over, we'd be able to go and capture it. So it seems like their way of operation is to randomly go to random places. And that's why you have random experiences and it gets difficult to catch them, which is why when it seems we catch something, it's completely random. We're like somewhere where yes, they may be flying through in a way, but we're catching them randomly with the camera just running. It's not like, hey, we knew that this was there, and so we stood there like a ghost in a house. You know, so it's extremely difficult to catch them. But a couple questions coming in from the audience here. This one from Catherine, who is asking, Tim, you take incredible drone shots of land and skyscapes, but have you ever had a drone wander mm -hmm. off and never be found again? <laughs> Um, I have not, but, um, you'd be interested to know I've flown just about 2 million feet now, uh, with DJI products for the camera recording. Um, I've also flown the solo 3DR. I've flown the DJI Phantom 3, which I have now the DJI Phantom 4, which I have now I've, uh, started my drone pilot, um, journey with uh, DJI Inspire 1. Um, so I was actually flying the drone that goes like 70 miles an hour and I was filming car commercials um, for car dealerships when I did, uh, I worked in um, automotive advertising for, for a while. And so I've been flying like over 2 million feet and not one time have I had one go away that wasn't a DJI product. So I would highly recommend to anyone who was getting into drones. Um, yes, I know we ha all have like theories about you know, DJI products are from China and oh my gosh, is the video going back to China? And that makes sense if you work in the military. Um, but for like us civilians, there's nothing better you can get for your money. The drone for the most part, every time for me has always come back. The only time I, I had a problem is if I took off from under a tree. So let's say, you know, cause where we live, shoot, there's the, the giant sequoia. So I could be, you know, standing under a tree limb and take the drone off. And I did that once. And I was, I was flying out. Um, gosh, I had to be like almost a mile and a half away and I lost signal and it came back. And when it got over me and started coming back down, it tried to go through the tree. So I had to like take over. Um, but with the DJI products, you're definitely going to get your money's worth. When I had the solo 3d R that uses a GoPro, um, I wouldn't recommend like, any of those four quality drone shots. So using a GoPro with a gimbal um, may seem okay, 
but it, it just doesn't work for me. It was always that fisheye look. I know GoPros can even switch away from it, but I promise you, like, if it's not DJI, the stability of the drone and the gimbal is just not comparable. And I did do a time where I um, raced quadcopters. So I had, like, the, v, the VR goggles, you know, and would, like, plug in and sit down. And then the, the racing quadcopter, you just see it through the classes. Um, so I, like, learned how to do, like, tricks and stuff like that. Um, so that's kind of what has led to, to those videos, you know, is doing it for a long time. It's really hard to get up there and like find the right shot. But, um, my advice is to, to try not to turn too much. You know, what you're trying to do is just fly nice and straight, um, and not bump it around and not get jacked by the wind and try to catch nice smooth shots. Just like if you were on the ground, you know, put the camera on a tripod. Um, like my video camera on a tripod and use a controller to zoom in to get a nice zoom in shot of a mountain. So you're kind of doing the same thing with your drone, you know, and trying to get the best quality you can if you want to catch those good shots. So, Well, I mean, by the angles you can get up, you can tell us whether there's flat earth or not in no time. No? Didn't find that funny? What happened to Tim? Weird. Our call just ended on Skype. All right. Let's get them back here. Let's get them back. That was weird. I don't think I hit the button accidentally. Maybe I did. I don't know. I didn't touch anything, man. And all of a sudden, they are gone. Weird. Weird. Either way. It's time for Thought of the Dave. Hey, Phoenix, how are you doing? Thought of the Dave happens every single day on this show. It's amazing. You mentioned Flat Earth, and all of a sudden, Skype crashes. What the Sam hell is going on? Thought of the Dave happens every single night. So what happens here is I take a question, I put it on my Facebook feed in the morning, and then I get you guys to respond. And see what you think about what's going on. Because in this show, we like to do a little bit of audience participation. Now, we may not take the phone calls, but, you know, we do like your questions. We do like everything about your responses. So the thought of the Dave is a way for you to kind of kick on in and, you know, gives us another reason, too, to play some good Ron Bumblefoot Thal music as well. Still tripping out over that. You know, Tim's probably on his phone like, what the hell went on there? What the Sam hell went on? He just hung up on me. What a jerk. No, Tim, I didn't. No, Tim, I didn't. I mentioned Flat Earth and all of a sudden Skype went poof. I don't know. So, today's thought of the Dave, as we always try to keep it towards the topic of the night, is... Hey, UFO people, why do you think Tom DeLonge has gone silent in the last two months publicly while Luis Elizondo has become the face of disclosure? Do you think Tom is too big-mouthed to trust? Do you think his days of of being a pawn are over? What's your belief? Comment below and detail. So, we talked about this in the last hour with Tim Doyle from UFO Seekers, ufoseekers.com. And he basically thinks that maybe Tom got a little bit embarrassed by his actions on the Joe Rogan interview. Because here he is dealing with some very big heavyweights on the government side. And when you are dealing with government heavyweights, especially in a controversial topic such as UFOs, using the F word 
or saying you're going to whip out your dick you know, on camera is not very conducive to probably the image that they want for disclosure. So maybe Tom has been put in the penalty box with a major misconduct, if we use a little bit of hockey terms there. And, you know, anytime I can get a little bit of hockey term in there, I'm going to do it. So my question once again today was... Do you think Tom DeLonge has gone silent in the last two months? Well, maybe is it on purpose? Maybe is it on purpose? I don't know. I think so. I think so. Right? And when you are talking about, you know, and I realize with Joe Rogan, it's not supposed to be a very, you know, heated, serious discussion. And, you know, Joe's a comedian. He's also very good at what he does, all right, with his podcast and has a very keen interest. Even though he's skeptical as hell, he has a very keen interest in these topics. But in the end, I think that that interview with DeLong probably got DeLong in some sort of trouble. I really do believe that. And why wouldn't it, considering here he was you know, talking about flashing the cameras. I mean, there's a time for rock star, and then there's a time for reality. And Tom, you chose to play with the big boys at this game, but then you go and make the amateur rock star comment. Right? So some of the comments that came through today, we only had three. It was a little bit of a slow day. One thing I'm noticing about the thought of the Dave is Mondays and Fridays are usually pretty slow. We're going to start off with Adnome's comment. Governmental disclosure will never happen. That would revile the technology advantage or the technological advantage. A true disclosure would be the masses coming out and reveling the undisputed evidence. We all know what's out there. Now, for those of you who don't know Ad Gnome in the chat room, he's addicted to gnomes. He's a gnomaholic. He really is. But I think disclosure has really happened. I really do. That article just kind of sealed it. But as John Alexander said last Thursday night on here, the U.S. government has never really denied UFOs since Roswell. They denied one crashed, but they've never denied UFOs. Right? So it's very, very intriguing in regards to everything that's gone on. I do believe disclosure happened. I call it a soft disclosure. If you've listened to me here numerous times over the last month, you will know that that's the way I feel about it. And I feel good for the experiencers who have uh, you know, gone their entire life, some of them, with being made fun of, with being criticized and ridiculed and laughed at because of everything that has gone on. You know, on Joe Roop's show last week, Lighting the Void, he had Whitley Strieber on. And 30 years after writing Communion, he's still getting harassed about the anal probing. We laugh at that. He decides to call it rape. Right? So... There is a lot of things that have gone on. And we're going to get to the next comment. This one comes from Keith. Keith says, I think it should be considered that he was used and now dropped because they, in brackets, whomever they are, don't need him anymore. He was a means to an end. The end game is beyond me. UFO politics are beyond my pale. I'm going to, maybe he meant palette. I don't know. All right, but it came out as pale. Now, I think Tom is still involved. 
I think they, you know, I think they need him to reach out to the younger masses because of his UF, because of his um, his music career. He, you know, he has a lot of followers. He's made a lot of money off of it, you know. And if he is going to be starting a publishing company and doing documentaries and movies and everything, they don't need him for the real stuff. He gets all the play toys. All right, he gets all the play toys and everything. You know, we don't see Tom. I think his days are limited in the true UFO disclosure process. I mean, when something is released, I think he will be he will be, you know, allowed to comment on it, but but for his days of breaking news and UFO stories, I mean, they've already shown that it's fully gone to Chris Mellon, but more so to Luis Elizondo. And and let's face it, DeLong has been cut out of the public picture, and I think a lot of that has to do with an embarrassing Joe Rogan interview. And I'm sure the two of the Stars PR people said, Tom, 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 what what are you doing? You can't be saying that. You can't be doing that. So I do think we haven't seen the end of DeLong in this process. I still think he's very highly involved, but I still think his days as being the front man of the media are definitely going to be changed for sure, in the long run. This leads to Gail's comment. Gail says, Since December 20th, we can only speculate what's happened to Mr. DeLong and his merry band of collaborators. But even if he were still yammering, who really cares? He has been a musician who has very little to back up his self-appointed position as the discloser. I like that. She used capital letters. So far, it appears to be a jokes-on-you experience for him, perpetrated by people who are many more moves ahead in this chess game of Disclosure than the general public can guess. Right now, I believe it's a matter of credibility. Who would you tend to believe the most? Luis Elizondo, the man who ran AATIP for five years with sound credentials backing him up, or an in-debt punk rocker from the 90s? I'm going with Elizondo. Well, of course, I think we're all going with Elizondo as well. Except nobody's asked Elizondo, what did he do and who was paying his salary between 2012 and 2017 when he left the government position? That's what I call an interesting question. That's where I want to see... Elizondo answered. That's what I was talking about when we were talking about the media earlier. You know, and, you know, throwing Alexander and company the softballs of questions. Right? Throwing the softballs of questions. What did the UFO look like? Please tell me that it's real. Are UFOs real? Instead of, what is Bigger Lowe's role? Why is he involved in everything? Please explain to me, Mr. Elizondo, what you were doing between 2012 and 2017. Were you still looking at the UFOs? Why can you not name your successor if you weren't involved in UFO files? Oh, wrong one. There we go. That's a big question that is yet to be answered on Spaced Out Radio. I want to say thank you to Tim Doyle for being here on the Mighty SOR tonight. Tim comes in the third Monday of every month with his feature, UFO Seekers. UFO Seekers can be found on Spaced Out Radio, ufoseekers.com, and youtube.com forward slash UFO Seekers. Tim's next appearance, let me look at the old calendar. i got to rotate here. February 18th is when Tim will be back, and I'm sure we'll have more intriguing news on UFOs, disclosure, and everything in between right after the next month. Tomorrow night on the program, Jonathan Whitcomb is going to join us. We are going to be talking about pterodactyls. And yes, I am rocking the crazy beard. Thank you, John, on Periscope. Now, pterodactyls. 
Are they real? Are they extinct like they should be, like we all think they are? Jonathan Whitcomb's research says, well, they may not be. They just may not be. We'll find out more as John will come on the first two hours tomorrow night. Hour number three, we are going to do open lines tomorrow night. Hour number three, open lines for your topic, anything you want to discuss, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time, Tuesday night at spacedoutradio.com. We want to say thank you to Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal for rocking us into tonight's show. Bumblefoot rocks us in and out of every show. That's why he is the official music of SOR. Remember, we have our GoFundMe account going on. GoFundMe.com forward slash we own the night. We are working on building a new studio here in SOR land. Your help is necessary. And it's going to be a lot of fun indeed when we get to the terrestrial days because we're going to laugh about these internet days and Skype crashing. We're going to say, boy, that was fun. Not really. We will talk to you in 21 hours from now. Thank you to everyone on Twitter, listening at home, listening in their cars, at work. The veterans of the SOR Space Travelers group on Facebook, I love you. Those of you on Spreaker tonight, you made it fun. Mr. Bumblefoot, before we call you in, we got to say, together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, will you please take us home? See you tomorrow, guys, and gals, and aliens. And Carl, where are you? Come on back sometime. See you tomorrow, everyone. Good night.